Yeah, so thank you for being on here and taking the time. You're generous your time. I know you did an episode with Mache on uh, Art Cafe, and then you've mm-hmm. been you've sent me some links that I've consumed some of them, which is really great. We're going to get into the AI thing, as we mentioned, but I would love to know a little bit more about you and, and to share your past with the audience that are listening so they can have a, a basis of where you come from in the realm of art and how you're involved with art and how you came to be as an artist. Sure. Um, all right. Well, again, thank thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, I've watched a bunch of episodes of this podcast. Uh, oh, you, you've been doing this for a long time, so it's really nice to connect and to and to meet you. You know, and I've seen your work online for a long time, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, funnily enough, I, I uh, when we connected this time to set up with the, or for the first time to set up this podcast, I was looking through your stuff. And I guess in all the years that I was seeing like your paintings and things like that, that you would post, I never caught that you were also like a huge car guy, like to the level that people will like send you cars, like supercars <laughs> to drive. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, uh, quite a life. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. It was yeah. very interesting to be like, oh, I had never caught that about Ash before. Yeah. Um, I like a lot of things and I'm like super passionate about them. So <laughs> it's a good that. and a bad thing. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Well, you. it's definitely shared amongst a lot of artists. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, me, my background. Yeah. Um, Family of artists so that, or how did you come into becoming an artist? Um, well, my my family is was supportive of art, but, um, you know, my sister did some painting. She really liked to paint, but it was a a fun hobby for her. I, I, I don't think she ever took it seriously as like a a job pursuit or something like that. But, um, I have been into art since I was very young, again, encouraged by my sister. Um, she put a sketchbook in my hand pretty young and I sort of, I don't remember any of this, but from her telling me, uh, basically right away, I was like, I should bring this with me everywhere and I should kind of try to draw as much as possible. Um, and she had, she says she hadn't told me to do that. So she doesn't know where I, that, that came from and that she and my mom thought I would sort of grow out of that, drop that. And then I just never did. I just kept going with it. Um, that doesn't mean that I always thought art was sort of like the path for me. Drawing, drawing specifically was something that I really, really loved doing. And that had just been with me since a very young age, but I didn't like feel like I was going to try to become a professional artist until much later, until I was like about 16 years old, 17 years old. It's a little hard to remember, but um, at that point I'd already been exposed to a lot of different forms of art making. So I had my first encounters with digital when playing around with like MS Paint um, on like Windows 95, you know, really, really yes. early on. Taking it's funny it back. to, <laughs> all the way back. It's funny to think of that as digital art, but you know, it is, it's just, you know, it, it just comes off like kid stuff back then. Mm. But um, I used to make like pixel art in there. You know, I tried to make like my own like uh, sprites for hypothetical Mega Man games and things so like that. Cool. Yeah, and I, and I also like drew in there with the mouse, you know, I was like interested in that. Um, my uh, brother saw that I was interested in that and he had gotten interested. Um, he's quite a bit older than me, so he, he was out of the house, but um, he had gotten interested in like 3D graphics. And I remember one day he came over and he just like installed a copy of Bryce 3D that he had onto our computer at our house and he left it there. And I just messed around with that. I was pretty young looking at that. Bryce 3D is this like now forgotten 3D program Mm -hmm. that like focused on like just being able to like generate mountains and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. But I spent so much time messsing around with that. I must've been, I was like 13 or younger or something like that. Uh, 32. 32. 32? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm 39. So we have a little bit of a gap, but somewhat close enough. We're, we're getting through the thirties together. Oh we're doing yeah. It together. I'm almost there. Well, well, I'm almost to you're, the forties. <laughs> you're so close. You made it. You made uh, yeah. it. We'll see. We'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going to make it. I think you're going to be fine. Hopefully. <laughs> I believe. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Bryce, that's so, crazy. I haven't heard that. Yeah, that I haven't was, heard that program in a long time. <laughs> I hadn't thought about it, uh, yeah. until very recently. I like, I like, I had done some conscious, um, searching of my memory mm-hmm. for what I had sort of done artistically as a kid. And um, I had like not, I'd not thought about it in decades at this point. I was like, oh my God, yeah, I remember that now. Mm. So 
I tried that. He then later on gave me like a copy of Maya. So going into high school, I'd been drawing a lot and I'd sort of discovered the digital realm. I knew, you know, personally didn't know anybody else who messed with that stuff. You know, it was just like me being interested in it. Mm. And, but you know how it is when you're a kid, you're interested in that stuff and you play with it, but you're not necessarily putting the pieces together. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I was like, I was playing a lot of video games mm. and I, I was also using these 3D programs, but I understood obviously that's how they make 3D games like Super Mario 64 or yeah. something like that. But it hadn't clicked that that was like a thing and a pipeline and like a thing that's happening in the world. Sure. And, and when I was about 16 or 17, um, actually I guess I could date it to whenever uh, Star Wars Revenge of the Sith came out. Um, I went to see that in theaters with one of my friends and I really liked it. And I stayed after the credits and I saw Ryan Church's name billed as concept artist or concept designer on that. And I remember sitting there in a theater and I was like, what in the hell is that? I've never heard that job before. <laughs> so I just remembered his name. It's a good thing he has a memorable name, yeah, Ryan Church, yeah. uh, as it slipped away. And I was like, huh, I gotta look that up later. And either that day or some days after I remembered that and I looked him up and that was like, boom, that explained it to me. That's yeah. when I realized that there was like a commercial art world and a commercial design world that was necessary to make the things and design the things that I had been enjoying for so many years. So yeah. th that really, um, that cracked it wide open for me. Um, based on that, you know, I looked at what school he went to and his friends had gone to. Uh, that set me down the path to applying to that same school that they had gone to, which the is arts. arts Pasadena? Yep, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I applied there um, in, in the second half of high school or started setting my sights on there. Um, got in, but not into the program that I wanted, wanted to wait to get into their new entertainment design program. Mm. So I moved out to LA to redo my portfolio while and be close to the school and take some night classes. Mm. Did a year doing that, got into the school after that, mm. four years at Art Center to sort of just, you know, brush under the table a whole lot of stuff. Yeah, um, that's a huge accomplishment that you went. It, so you went to, you got into Art Center, you waited for the entertainment um, program. Yeah. And then you I, took I it. had gotten in, I had gotten into illustration first mm. and I, I did not know entertainment design was a major at the time because it was brand new. It was only like one year old. Yeah. It's like Scott, and, was that Scott's program that he was running? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was department chair when I went in mm. and he, he's great. He's, guy. Oh man, Scott's great. He, yeah. he stepped down, I want to say when I was, halfway through mm. if i remember correctly because i took my design process class was with him so he must have been there for at least the whole first year mm. um that that i was there cool. um yeah so four years there huh that's an intense school yeah. too uh, oh god <laughs> maybe give somebody an idea that is not familiar with <clears throat> i know the pedigree of there especially at the time um that was a world-class school where all top talent go through there and you kind of get chewed through this machine and then spit out the other side and you become a component for the industry. Could you explain yeah. to people kind of how it works? Cause I've heard nightmare stories of just like, you know, um, projects and assignments and the workload and the, and all that kind yeah. of stuff and kind of the breaking you of your system basically. But yeah, you, for those that are not familiar, you got a story or something. Yeah. Um, I would, so most of those stories and the lineage that is out there and the narrative about it, um, I would say they were true, you know, when, when I was going through it. Um, I, I would say that the substantive portion of that being true is uh, myself making stupid decisions and the environment in the school encouraging stupid decisions a lot of the time. Sorry about the siren that's going by. I live it's in okay. New York City. Hopefully somebody's, so. everybody's okay. Oh, you're in New York, okay. Yeah, we're yeah, gonna have these they're, a couple they're, times. <laughs> they're probably coming for me. I just don't know what's wrong yet. That's probably it's what's going AI on. AI bots are after you. <laughs> they finally found me. They've been pointing my location. They sent the, the robot cops to get me. Yeah. Um, so it, it was a lot of a lot of stupid decision-making. It this This phrase gets thrown around a lot these days um so you know it's kind of a little bit charged but 
I only kind of get it now looking back on it. It's like, it was a little bit of a toxic environment for real. Like the, first off, it's like we all collectively decided like, let's forget that we're trying to draw goblins as a job, right? Like let, let's all forget that and pretend that this is all very serious and that it matters who's better than who. And it's like, if you don't, if you can't pull it off, that means something about you. And it's, we've got to pretend that we're in some sort of military boot camp, right? And there were teachers who reinforced that, you know? And it's just like, it's linguistic stuff sometimes. It's just like, they would call us like art center special forces or something like that, or, or talk very directly about how like, you guys are supposed to be better than other art students and things like that. So it's like when you're young, and especially I was a young guy and young guys, you know, you're looking to prove yourself, you know? Um, that, that lands strongly with you, you know, you, it's easy to, to believe that and to sort of drink the Kool-Aid on that and sort of want it to be true. And yeah, why wouldn't it, you? Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. What are you and, going there for, but to be the best? Yeah. It's, 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 it's not, it's not like it was cheap, you know, and it was competitive to get in. So it's usually like what, about a quarter mil or so? Yeah. Total. It could easily come out to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, they, like, Go ahead, I mean, that sorry. was like that was like an unprecedented amount to have an art education, but you were getting oh. the the idea that was that you would go there, you would kill yourself for it for four years, have a, an enormous debt, but you could take that and go plant into a job relatively yeah. quickly because of the network it provides and having yep. portfolio reviews and all of these people that work for Disney and so on and so forth, they're doing mm. peer reviews of the work and the students and teachers are all kind of intermingled. So it's like a workforce assembly. Yeah. So yeah, it's like, I get it. Cause it's like, you're the best, of the best, you know, like the Navy seals of art, you know, if there is yeah. such a thing, <laughs> the, I don't think there is, but it definitely, no, there's it no is. such it, thing. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's it, nice it, to think about it like that. Indeed. Yeah. It's, yeah. I can't deny that it was fun in the moment when we were there. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I look back and, um, you know, there were times where I like fell asleep driving my car home. Mm. And when I got home, I was like, I felt cool about that. I was like, I'm really busting my hump harder than anybody else. And now <laughs> as a 32 year old man, I'm like, you could have killed yourself or someone else. Yeah. Like, that's not cool. That it's, like it's not. Whiplash. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It really is. That, that's one of my favorite movies because yeah. of the experiences that I had at Art Center. I had similar so, experiences uh, starting out to working at Prologue and working with these giants. Um, yeah. It's part of what you're cut from. You know, yeah. it, it shows you what you're made of and you get to find that. But sorry, you're saying Art Center. I just want, for those that are listening that aren't familiar with Art Center for some whatever reason, it's a very unique experience, I think. And everybody that's gone through it that I've known in various degrees has experienced a, a magnitude of differences. But almost all of the similarities are you'd go there and cut your teeth there and it was very tough. And Mm -hmm. um, it's a grinding process basically. So to, yeah. we, to, to basically strip you of all your past habits that are bad and put in new habits that are supposed to be good fundamentals. Yeah. I, I do also wanna, you know, it, it may sound like I'm coming off really negative against the school and I, I hope no one thinks that's true. I mean, I did go back and teach there. So obviously I think there's something good about the school. Sure. Uh, I think there's many great things about the school. Mm. Um, I, I do wanna say that there's a lot of schools that everything you just described, right? Like the, you're mingling with the industry, you're in there with the teachers. They'll say that and it's not true. And one of the best things that Art Center has going for it is that it's true there. It yeah. actually is real there. I had tons of experiences there that I just can't imagine really would have happened anywhere else. Like I had, I had a class in the later half of the program called Idea to Pitch, which I then is one of the classes that I went back and taught. And um, when I, at the final for that class, which was taught by Nick Pugh, who was like an old school concept designer. He's not old, you know what I mean by old school. He's just like, he's been around forever. Yeah, he's um, in the data set. Oh, I bet. <laughs> Sorry, he jokes. For sure, for sure. <laughs> too, um, too soon. <laughs> he, he actually designed like a famous car, actually. He designed like some sort of gold um, modular um frame car. I don't know. I, 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 just cause you're a car guy. I, yeah. I felt like bringing that up, but um, he has like a very, very famous, like indie build car. Um, sure. and, um, so he taught this class where you would write 
a, not write like a script for a movie, but he would teach you how to outline one, like how to get to a good pitch. Sure. You'd make the art for it. And in the final, you actually had to pitch it to real movie executives. You mm -hmm. had to pitch it to real movie executives. That's great. And that's what that's what the final was. And I can't imagine where else you would have that mm. experience. And mm -hmm. when I pitched mine, um, I had uh, a production company associated with Warner's actually like want to talk about it and like have a meeting afterwards and hear more about what could possibly be done with it. And it's like, that's a unique experience as yeah. far as I can tell. Like it requires a very specific link with the industry to yeah. get to do stuff like that. And if you're gonna invest in anything, invest in yourself, you know? I was I was gonna go there, but it was just so far-fetched. I was such a poor kid, <laughs> literally. I was like, I like made like $8,000 a year or something, and that's what I was living off yeah. of. It was just like really stripped down living. Um, but I, I thankfully, the, the junior college that I went to, one of my teachers, my mentor at the time, Chris Polens, he was a teacher on the weekends at Art Center. So I would go with him on the weekends in his car, and I would sit in his class Nice. And just have the art center experience through that kind of vicariously. And, you know, he was, he was, incredible. that's so cool. I really love him and I have so much uh, of myself. It comes from his guidance and, and, and his, his patience with me. Cause I was just so stupid. So yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, that actually to touch on what you're saying, like you're not trying to bash art center and I don't think you are. I think it's wonderful that you have an honest perspective of it, having gone through it, but it's almost like when you're done watching Whiplash, if you hate that teacher or not. I actually love the teacher and I love what he did, even though I think his tactics were horrible. Yeah. Sometimes mastery comes from, you have to be pushed beyond your realm. And a lot of us, we live in a comfort bubble because of society allows us to do so because we're very blessed and privileged to have the lives that we have with all these conveniences. But to do something great, you have to go beyond that thing. And everybody has a different engine to get there. Um, and some people disagree with those things, but I don't really yeah. have a problem with it. I think like, don't throw chairs at me, but you know, like, yeah, call me names if you like. And sure, that's whatever. <laughs> sure. chair, chair throwing is a surprisingly common technique in those realms for some reason. I guess it's because it's like, what else are you gonna throw? That's all that's in the room. Yeah, so. you can throw a human and there's a chair and that's, yeah, it's, and it, you can throw it, so, and it's memorable, yeah. so. <laughs> and the chair is the lower liability option when compared to the person. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's a pressure situation that happens there. And what's interesting too, to talk about art in, in regards to like the pressure cooker of what an ecosystem, a social ecosystem, such as like art center, for example, what that does for an artist mind and the creative thing and, and how disparate and different an artist creative soul is compared to the industry and all these things. And these are things we're going to definitely get into when we start talking about, because it's great to know that you come from that pedigree because if anybody can understand this is somebody that spent a quarter of a million dollars and then some on their life investing in themselves and then have this device that's kind of created <laughs> the ether yeah. and kind of be so disruptive as it is. Okay. Yeah. So you went back in, in Utah at art center. huh? Mm -hmm. that's yeah. Cool. I, for, first I, well, first I went into industry. So I um, started a little bit in school doing a few freelance gigs um, uh, I think my first freelance gig was like, it was either 2011 or 2012. So it's been about a decade of commercial work now for me. Um, that was on like, uh, that was from an open art test on CG hub. I don't, I'm sure you remember yeah. CG hub. Yeah. yeah they had classic. a classic, they yeah. had put out this, uh, this art test just open. Like they just, which is pretty rare. I mean, a lot of, you, I haven't seen much like this after, but they were just like, if this was the prompt, just send us what you would do and we'll get back to you. It's the and, slowest uh, AI prompt. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I remember I did that. I was like squeezing it in between um, uh, homework assignments mm. and I sent it off and that got me my first gig. That was with a, on doing costume designs on a Russian MMO called All Odds. I want to, I actually um, can't remember if that's the name of the game or if that's the name of the- um, yeah, I can't remember if that's the name of the game or if that's the name of the company. I don't remember now. Uh, I think it was the game. I think the game was called All Odds. Mm. And um, uh, it was an MMO. Uh, uh, I'll never forget it because I remember like um, the like my first week's pay was like what it took me to UPS overnight to Russia, the signed contract for the work. And I was like, 
this should have been a PDF. Why are we doing this? This is crazy. (laughs) (laughs) So, so that was my first gig, uh, freelance. I did a few other things and then, um, I did not graduate from art center. I did, I did my four years there. Um, I finished, um, I, I had my, I had spaced it so that my last semester would be like my portfolio review and my last couple classes, mm-hmm. I'd held off some stuff because I was like, I just want to just focus on that mm-hmm. for my last semester. Because at that point, I'd had some serious bouts of burnout and depression mm-hmm. from what I was doing to my mind and my body. Mm-hmm. And I had sort of already realized like, I'm going to need to take responsibility for what I'm willing to do and how far I'm willing to push. And like, what's just pure volume, what's quality, things like that. So mm-hmm. I took some light I took a semester was a little bit lighter so I could focus on portfolio for graduation. Turns out that that all meant nothing because I got a job offer from a theme park design firm um, in the intervening time before I went back to do the final uh, semester. And that aligned with a, a little bit of family troubles. Uh, my father got deported uh, at right about that time. And he was the main person supporting my mother, um, and helping to support my sister and her daughter at that time. Wow. So, so at that point, and I, I went through school, like we said, art center is very expensive. I was paying for it with loans. You know, I didn't have money. I, I just sort of said like, let's take the loans. We'll figure it out. We've got to make this work somehow, which mm-hmm. is, you know, I can't advise that for everybody. I'm, sure. I'm very fortunate that that didn't burn down my life. <laughs> um, but uh, it was like, I was in all this debt from all the loans that I had taken out to pay for school. And now my family had gone through that tragedy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, then I, and I had this job and I was like, damn, I don't think I should go back to school and lose $40,000 on one semester um, in the middle of all of this. Yeah. Uh, so I basically said, I'll see if I go back after this resolves. It did not resolve. Uh, I, I stayed at work and at a certain point, I think after about like a year had gone by, I was like, I think, you know, the heat and the momentum was gone. And I'm like, I think I'm just going to stay at work. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did not go back and graduate. Um, I stayed at work. I worked at that company for about something over three years. And uh, then at that point, I moved back to New York. And so that would have been 2015-ish, 2016-ish. And when I moved to New York, I said, I'm going to do more freelance because New York was, when I moved, I was like, there's not that many studios out here, especially not for stuff that I wanted to look at, like games and things like that. So that began like f- the freelance portion of my career and sort of doing more my own thing portion of my career. Made my YouTube channel in 2018 or 2018 or 20, no, it's 2019. I made my YouTube channel in 2019. And now here we are. I'm mad at robots on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> nice uh, closure. Uh, yeah, to touch on some stuff that you mentioned because there's a lot in there to unravel. Yeah, this the journey, and and also you know, I, I ironically I went through, I got my associate's degree, but I went to go get my bachelor's degree in college, and I was one class away from graduating, and I just decided not to, because I, mm-hmm. I just I was like I'm already working, and yeah, yeah, and you know the real funny irony of all this stuff is nobody's ever asked me to see the, the you know, the college degree or anything, and and it makes sense. I was on a. I was on Matt Ferris podcast. He's a, a big car guy and, and a, like a commenter in cars and stuff, journalist. And he was like, who the fuck cares about a car, an, an artist uh, um, like degree? And, but I think mostly it's people that don't really understand what we do and how we came to be who we are and all that kind of stuff. But I yeah. wouldn't imagine anybody's asked you if you've been to the art center or if you've you come from that. Yeah. It's almost like, no. it's just like you do it for yourself in a sense and you do it because yeah. you want to be, you know, you want to see how far you push it. You mentioned quickly, and we don't have to go into it because it's probably more personal, but the depression and burnout seems to be mm-hmm. a thing that happens to all of us, especially if we go, because I feel like, you know, your reality is, is only as far as you are willing to push the boundary. And yeah. that's where you can find depression and burnout. It's on the outer banks of your life, basically. And and I yeah. think that you should, you should, you owe it to yourself in your life to get to those levels and see, but make sure you can come back 
and usually the lifeline is loved ones and family people yeah. that can actually remind you who you truly are. But how did you, cause I did, did the, the, did the constraints of going to an intense elite education platform like that create that for you? Or was it mm-hmm. kind of push you into that direction? And then how did you pull yourself out? I asked this because this is something I talk about in the podcast, but I feel like a lot of people that are listening to this are suffering it with this stuff yeah. either right now or could just use a little bit of help. And you know, that's one of the points of the podcast is to alleviate these kind of things. And you know, yeah, anyways, but yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. I, I think this stuff is super important and it's one of the things that I find myself helping my students with um, the most. So yeah, the, it was definitely the school environment, but it, it was not the school's fault right? Like uh, for everything that I said before about how there can be a bit of a toxic environment uh, or there was back then, um, I do think things have gotten better at Art Center since I left. Um, We have to remember, or I think it's important to remember that you're still always choosing to take that on, right? It's like at, at every time where you feel completely compelled by the energy of the environment and you feel like this is what you must do, Truly on the inside, you can feel like you're being completely compelled, like you're forced to do these things. But with the distance of time, you look back and you see there was always another choice. You could have just not bought into that. You could have made different choices at all of those junctions. So what I was doing was that I was basically heaping on myself every responsibility Mm. I could imagine or like every demand that I could imagine from myself for myself. And the problem with that is that you can imagine whatever you want, you know, at a certain point it becomes disconnected from reality and you can just increase the demands exponentially and just infinitely. So, um, uh, and I think it's especially hard in art because art is so mushy. You know, it's so subjective. Like it, it's, if you find yourself like, if, if you find yourself competing with a classmate, for example, mm. there's certain fields where the competition could be pretty objective, right? Like if it's physical, it's like who crossed the finish line first. And even if it's something more quantitative, it's like whose code w- worked first, you know, something like that. Sure. In art, it's like <laughs> you both can put in great efforts And for reasons no one can quite explain, one piece can be a flop and one piece can be a winner. And it's not necessarily the one that got more time or that got more work. And it's like, that's one of the things that makes art so mysterious, but- And also amazing. Amazing, but if you get- No one is ever the master. (laughs) So one of the the dark- (laughs) Absolutely. And one of the dark sides of that is that if you go too deep into competing or wanting these things from yourself, you're just, you're playing tennis without the net. There's no actual rules. And I found myself on the dark side of that. So (laughs) I, I was just like, I was just like, um, I was just like, it's not good enough to just deliver the homework. I've got to over deliver on all the homework. I'm never going to miss a class. You know, I'm going to get perfect attendance in every class. Mm. Um, I'm going to achiever in everything else that you do as well. No, no, it was just just this, this ecosystem kind of pulled that out of you. Yeah, and I think my love for art mm. uh, really summons that out of me. I don't think I have that very much in mm. other parts of my life. I think for some reason, art really gets its claws in me. Mm. Um, and so I made a lot of bad calls like that. And I basically just wasn't sleeping, wasn't in a healthy balance with my workload. And another part of the problem was that in my youth, I had always coasted on um, being a good test taker, just being kind of precocious, uh, got by on being able to sort of write well without too much practice added and things like that. And I think that that's a, an experience that a lot of, you know, gifted young people have, you know, it's like, but that is to say a lot of us, if people have been telling us, Oh, you're gifted in your youth, it's like, we're not quite sure what that means. Mm -hmm. And then it just sort of pushes us into this environment where we're just like, all right, so so I'm just good at this, right? So no one gives us habits or how to structure our life or how to control ourselves in a useful way. Um, so I was definitely suffering. Plus you have a mentor, 
Yeah. Unless you have a mentor. Yeah. yeah. And I did not. I did not. So which is fundamentally I, um, how we should actually learn art is through mentorship program. Yeah. That's how the masters I, did it. Yeah, yeah. That's really, that's actually the old way. That's mm -hmm. the way that has produced some of history's greatest art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. all that to say, um, um, and in high school, art too. <laughs> <laughs> Just again to your point that there's no there's no rhyme or reason yeah <laughs> yeah bless it that's what keeps art so beautiful yes but um yeah so i found myself burnt out because um i had been tricked into thinking that the adrenaline fueled anxiety attacks that had gotten me through essays and tests as a child mm. that people labeled as me being gifted which I was not, it was just me being hopped up on adrenaline and anxiety and getting through these things and having some <laughs> natural acumen for things. When I found myself an in an environment that was beyond my natural capabilities, mm. I had no tools mm. for time management, for discipline, for habit making. Mm. So the only, because I was not sophisticated with those things, the only reaction I had was just murder yourself, just yeah. explosive, <laughs> output as much anxiety as possible as much adrenaline as possible yeah. and um it wrecked me as it would wreck anybody yeah, so it's a natural it yeah it, re yeah it not at all so i hit that i hit that pretty quick i want to say i hit that somewhere like a little past the halfway point of the four years okay and and um i i just yeah, like I said, depression, burnout, not knowing why I was doing this, losing the love for it completely, yeah. not really not really seeing anymore like why am I feeling so competitive with my friends when I'm really starting to like lose faith in this whole endeavor? Like uh, yeah. it, if this is what it's going to be, why am I going to keep doing this? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um well, I fuel, you know, you need to have a reason why you're dying. Yeah, we're dramatic. Yeah. We're dramatic people. So, and your mind and your body is basically saying you're you're an atrophy. So you better have mm -hmm. a reason. And you say, well, it's because I want to be the best and I want to be competitive. And then you go, well, that's a good enough fuel. But that that octane burns out faster. And it the, does. What is it like? In uh, was it? I was just watching Blade Runner, and when uh, Terrell tells uh, Roy, the 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 star that burns twice as bright is the one that dies or something like that. It's, it's, it's so true. true. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah. It's completely true. We all have a, you know, we all have a fuel, you know, and um, different fuel burns differently. Some birds brighter and, but there's a byproduct to that, to that burn, you know, <laughs> you literally yeah. get burned. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mentally. I was scorched, I would say. Yeah. I was, I was completely scorched. Yeah, perfect storm for you. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's weird with with artists too. And this is something like when I do talks and stuff, and my wife, oh, is, she's really great at critiquing me because she's not an artist and she can give me this outside perspective, outside of my own perspective of ego and stuff. But she's when mm. I do talks, usually I, I always mention three books that changed my life as an artist. They're not even art based books; they're just they're books that help them the cognitive mind. I mean, I guess you could say them. I don't know if you've ever read them. One of them is Eat That Frog. I talk about it a lot in the podcast. But eat mm -hmm. that frog is really great. It helped me understand how to like differentiate your priorities as a human being and mm -hmm. how to basically delegate the ones that you shouldn't be doing and then focus on the ones that you should that are more aligned with your core core G chief aim in life. So mm -hmm. just whatever it might be. Um, and then setting like um, kind of a rule book and a platform to like priority prioritizing things, which kind of really helps basically. And then so there was that one and then uh, mastery, which is a book I read all the time. Every, about every six months I'll read, listen to it, just little chapters and stuff. But he documents all the masters are not all of them, but like a big range, like Freddie Roach is like Manny Pacquiao's boxing coach. And he's considered to be a master of his craft, but his journey is so weird. And then he also talks about like Da Vinci's path and where Da Vinci comes from and how Da Vinci kind of evolved as a human being and that curiosity, but that's a really great book. And then lastly is a, is a book called, um, the war of art. You're, you that, that one I've read Stephen Pressfield's yeah. the first time yeah. somebody really helped me personify what this thing is a procrastination. It's the first time I could like listen to somebody's words. He took the words that permeated and I was like, Oh shit, there's this thing that's like li literally sitting on my shoulder and I can look at it now and be like, fuck off and then, yeah. and then it's gone and I don't really procrastinate really anymore. It's, you know, I've realized if I am, I can catch it because procrastination, you basically get crushed by it as a yeah. young creative, you know, but those books oh, yeah. have like, 
I really wish that I had them and I wish that I was able to, to really consume them at an early age. I really yeah. got to read Mastery because I've heard that one recommended many times by Yo, people. Yeah. Based on the things that I've heard you talk about and your approach to things, I think it's going to hit you like a lightning bolt. It's really great. I got to check it out. There's two books. They're by different authors. There's one by um, uh, George Leonard, Mastery. I'll send you some links. And okay. then there's uh, Robert Greene. They're both fantastic. One's smaller than the other, but both have incredible value. Yeah, and if you see me typing or texting, I'm literally just grabbing what you're saying and I'm putting it in my notes because I have OCD and I'm no sweat. distracting. But yeah. okay, I was literally just doing that too. Awesome. <laughs> well, I was going to say because while you're doing it, so um, I didn't want you to think I'm like on uh, Open GPT or something. So <laughs> <laughs> that'd be awesome. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, well, it's it's good for this because like we're going to get into the AI stuff, but I feel like it's really important to understand who you are, where you come from, what you've given, the sacrifices that you've made in your life at the same time, why you do are what makes you do what you do. That's all somewhat of the past for you. Where are you at now with your relationship to this concept called art? Like where, what motivates yeah. you? Where are you at spiritually or however, that's the wrong word, but you know what I'm saying? Like what connects you to doing what you're doing with your art nowadays? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it has transformed a lot um, in my, you know, as should be pretty clear from what I said, I think um, in my youth, I was really driven by, well, a lot of the youthful motivators, you know, I, I wanted to, I had picked something pretty hard for myself pretty young, you know, it was like, all right, I'm going to try to be an artist. Like that's, you know, not very few people support you in that. Very few people think it's a good idea. So a, a lot of my energy <laughs> went into like, does. <laughs> yeah. So I, a lot of my energy went into like, we got to make this work. And what does it take to make it work? And that, that sort of distorts the practice, I think inevitably, you know, I really, you spent, I, you know, there's just unbroken years where you're running everything through the filter of like, does this produce a job? Right. And that's not everybody's path, but that's the one that I went through because, um, I needed a job. You know, I didn't come from a background where I was going to have money or could be supported. So it was like, if I want to be an artist, it's like, it's got to be in a money producing way. I need to be able to get a job with it or else it's not going to work out and I'm going to be homeless. So I, so I focused, sure. I ran everything through that lens for years, you know, hmm. and um, at a certain point that lens will become unscrutinized once you've become so used to it. So I had that for a long time. Um, probably after I started working in the studio, probably after the first year of working in studio, that that first year was really like, I things change because you're like, oh, I did it. I have a job that can support me doing art. Like everything you'd thought of, like the status of being able to say, I have an art job and having... I don't know, something interesting to say at parties. Like, oh yes, well, you know, I design theme parks, go figure, right? Like all of that stuff. I would tell people it, I work at a grocery store just so I wouldn't have to talk about art. <laughs> I do that now. Now I tell my bar, now I tell my barber, I'm like, I work in marketing and I just yeah. don't talk about it. I don't want to discuss it at all. But um, it's funny but how back things then, change. Yeah. Oh God, they change completely. That's the thing, they change completely. But back then, you know, uh, that was definitely there. And, you know, I don't think I ever personally like relished in those things, but it's it's hard to ignore when you hit those milestones and the shine just wears off pretty quick. You know, you you realize like nobody cares what you say at a party That's or what like fuel. Yeah. 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 So you, you say that a couple of times and you're like, no, you could have said anything. Nobody gives a goddamn. They're just trying to, they're trying to survive this party the way that you are. And that's all that's happening there. Yeah. They're filling up the void <laughs> space by asking you a question that they don't really care about. So indeed, <laughs> unless yeah. they do. And then you can talk and then you made a good friend and that happens too. So, but it most of the time happen. it's not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So things started to wear off and I just started to feel like comfortable, like, oh yeah, no, I, or, yeah, it's, it's just a job. It's another job. Here we are. And, mm -hmm. and then that gave me the room to start to realize that I'd put that lens on it and to very lightly scrutinize it again. I was like, huh, how, how did I get here? You know? And in the early stages that, um, my reaction to that was like, well, you know, now we should try to 
get a different art job that is more like perfectly aligned with um, what we want to be doing or something like that, which is the classic thing. You know, I think a lot of us had the experience of like you got the first art job and then it's like, right now I'm going to jump niches, right? I'm going to go yeah. from advertising to games to movies and I'm just going to, there's got, it's like, well, I like playing video games, so I must love making them, right? So Isn't you kind of- <laughs> the biggest decisions we make are like that? They're so vapid almost or like not even- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's hysterical, really. It's really funny. It just really goes to show you, like, I think I sent you the Rick Rubin talking on Lex's podcast. Yeah. And, and when he said, like, the fact is we really don't know much of anything. And once you yeah. let, once you acknowledge that and understand it and let it all go, that's when you actually learn. <laughs> yeah. But that's actually a point to it. It's like, if you think about what we do, we make such this, we make such a big thing out of such a, like, we do so much from such a small decision. I mean, if you think about it, how many people have had children with people they don't even care about and they didn't even realize it, but they were just like on the moment of it. It just goes to show yeah. you how chaotic life really is, you know, if Dude, you think about it. Dude, it's so crazily chaotic. Yeah, because so when you're saying chaotic. that, I'm thinking that too, going, shit, I didn't really think about those things like as intensely as I could. And I think at the time, maybe it was just, I didn't have the capacity to really think outside of that small window of thought, you know? Yeah, it was, I was just thinking because the same thing for you, the motive was get a job, pay for a living, exist, coexist. Mm -hmm. Happiness comes after, you know, it was yeah. almost like do the machine. And like you said, you picked one of the harder things in society to succeed at, because especially at the time, let's date ourselves in there. Like there was when I first started coming up. I grew up with a family of exceptional artists. Everybody in my family mm. was incredible. And I'm sitting there yeah. as a kid going, well, shit, they didn't do it as art. They, they didn't, they, there was no, there was no infrastructure. There was no industry for them to do. There was, there was entertainment in a sense of, oh, I can paint signs on glass for a grocery store, you know, right. like that's not a way to make the bills, you know? So for me, I was like, I'm really going the deep end because I'm around these giants, my family who are incredible, but and thankfully I was born in a time and now it's gotten crazier because we have these NFTs and all these kind of things that that's a whole nother topic to talk about. But the infrastructure has been really crazy, something really interesting, but shoot, what was I saying? Sorry, I jumped into it. You were talking about making big life decisions, but off of, oh, that's right. You're saying like, well, I tried this, I'm gonna go there. It reminds me of yeah. also like when I was watching um, uh, Fight Club and Tyler's in the bathroom with, uh, I forget his name, but Edward Norton. I think they just call him the protagonist. Yeah, but Tyler and Tyler yeah. basically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he's like- The spoiler warning for people yeah. who haven't seen <laughs> oh, Fight Club. Shit, sorry. <laughs> if you haven't seen Fight Club this time, then you should turn this podcast you, off. Not turn, go watch it yeah. right now, watch it twice. Yeah, it's a very special little <laughs> piece of cinema. It's just it, it was. It was one of my favorites back when I was applying for Art Center. I would just play it on the TV in the background over yeah. and over again while working on my portfolio. Well, it's total fuel for that state of your life too, because you're basically becoming that person. So you're like fueling mm -hmm. yourself off the ego and the and the this like second version of yourself too, which I can imagine. Yeah. But when he's sitting there in the bathtub and he said, I was I called my dad and I told him he was like, Well now what? And he's like, I don't know, have a family. Well now what? Go to college. Oh now what? You know, it's it's the same thing. Like we make these big decisions that set a trajectory in our lives based on such small incremental moments of thought, which is also kind of brilliant, you know? I mean, think about how the world was discovered in a sense. I mean, it was already, people were already there, but how the world kind of connected into a network of humans just came from somebody going, well, I'm just going to go out in that ocean and yeah. there's probably something out there. <laughs> it's like, damn, you know? Think about how, like how risky that must have been, but anyways, uh, I digress. But you were saying you were going through like the the motions, the cycles. Yeah, yeah, and so I that that was sort of my first reaction to getting a little bit of space and being like, you know, it, it's a privileged position to be in. It's like you you got the hard thing that is already hard enough to get. So once you're there, then you can kind of stretch a little bit and be like, all right, well, how can I? what's next, you know, how can I do it better or something like that. So um, I started setting my sights on other things. And, you know, like I was working in theme parks at the time, I was like, I think I'd like to give an honest swing at uh, video games. I want to try 
working in video games. I'd had some uh, touch and go encounters with film as well. So I was like, I'm gonna try to um, actually follow through on some of those and do some film work. And then uh, like so many people, the, the big event was that life slapped me in the face. So in, in sort of the, the I, I hadn't gotten around to a lot of those things, but in the middle of thinking about it and thinking about how I was going to change things, my father died and he died by suicide actually. So that would have been in 2015. And that, no, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's dramatic stuff, but it's the stuff of life, you know? And it was like, like any situation like that, it's a confluence of all sorts of things that were occurring over years and years and years and years. But that, um, that, I, I mean, I mean, it should, it should go without saying, but it's just like it completely rewrote my life, you know, and it, it, it does that for so many people, you know, losing a loved one, having your first sort of head on collision with just how chaotic life actually is. Yeah. And, um, Were you that really, say again, Were you close with your dad? Yeah. I mean, I loved my dad, you know, I, I, now I'm, I, I wasn't. <laughs> Have you processed all that? I've tried, yeah. you know, I've, I've tried. I, no I way would, to do that, to process it. Yeah. It It's, you know, I, for anybody out there who's going through these experiences, um, the, the, the main thing I would say is don't go through it alone. Like mm. try to get help. You know, I'm, I, after I went through, after I went through that experience, I definitely, folded in on myself for a little bit. And I feel very lucky that it was relatively speaking, because a lot of people fold in on themselves after that for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I folded in for relatively shorter, you know, maybe a year-ish or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And then I, cause you know, I'm a pretty sensitive guy. I realized again, you know, I, I'd had feelings like these back when I was in school. I was like, damn it, you can't, th this ain't right. You know, and you've mm -hmm. got to do something about it. So. Um, something that really helped me was that I went to survivor support groups. So mm -hmm. I went to an environment where there was multiple people who had been through a similar situation yeah. and we all got to talk through the experience. Um, it was led by licensed therapists. Um, I did that for, I've been to a lot of those meetings. I did those for, um, a long time, a, a few years. And then I, uh, I went into one-on-one -on -one therapy as well. And I did one-on-one -on -one therapy. Um, you know, uh, for anyone who's going through anything like that, my heart goes out to you and, you know, we all have different paths. And I think that, you know, it's a fundamental right of human beings to sort of usher themselves through pain and suffering in a way that they feel comfortable with. But yeah. if I give anybody any advice. It's like, you don't have to go through it alone. Like go, go get some help. Don't feel bad about getting help. And the support groups are for the most part free. You know, and as it should um, be, yeah, yeah, and you, you know, I, I know a lot of people struggle with like, oh, therapy costs money. It's like support groups really help me. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are like the one that I went to, where they're run by licensed therapists, even yeah. though they're free. It's like they're very, very good. Mm. They're very, very good. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot to take on. To I lost one of my best friends uh, when I was twenty-one. He got hit by a car, and he died. And that was a uh, yeah, it was super traumatic. It really shifted my way of thinking and approach to life. We go through life thinking that, yeah, it's okay, tomorrow's there, you know? And a yeah. lot of people just kind of hit pause button or they, you know, I don't know. After that moment, I was like, well, I'm not just living for myself only. I have to live for him. And I really turned it up after that. I was like, yeah. it's time to get, it's time to get busy. You know, it's time to make this shit happen. And it's time yeah. to live this life fully, you know, no regrets and really living every moment and soaking it up because and then and then my grandpa passed away quite soon after that and i was like okay well, really gotta <laughs> you know uh it, it i think it's you know it depends on how you take it you take the, if you take these things as a massive loss as a as almost like a lesson a beautiful lesson of life how yeah. how, how fleeting it is and and um i think that's at least for me that was the, the fuel i got the mechanism and uh yeah but that's that's tough dude yeah, I can't imagine, the, um, especially if you're closer to your dad too, and 
dealing with that. It's got to weigh a lot on your mind. Yeah. Yeah. It was the hardest experience of my life, you know, and it it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't ever completely get better. You know, like I said, it's, it's, it's an, yeah, it's an experience of realizing that, you know, even with the people that you're close with, it's like, you don't always know what's going on with people that really the, um, the things that you would never expect could happen are on the table. You know, that life really is very surprising. You know, I never, I never would have thought that would happen. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's That's the case um, a lot with, uh, these situations. I find that I hear that a lot. People are just, what, you know, I don't understand, but it's just there for those people. And oftentimes it's just lurking and a lot of people are suffering too. It's really hard. It's hard to, uh, yeah, the mental stuff. I, th- I feel like we've become much more cognitive of it a lot more after COVID too. And I have close family members that deal with like extreme anxiety kind of situations. And yeah. thankfully I have not had any of those things. And it's hard because the mental is all hidden. So you can't really tell, you know, and you have to ask the person, you know, you have to have c- code words and things to help, you know, and, yeah. and uh, you know, I always tell them, make your world small, you know, your word's too big right now, make it small you know, consolidate it. And, and I'm right here, you know, so <laughs> it's very that's tough. good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I yeah, learned that it, actually it, from a Navy SEAL reading a Navy SEAL book. They were dealing, I think it was like they were under like heavy fire and this person like managed to survive through like complete chaos. And damn. all he said is he just made his world small. He couldn't think damn. out. He couldn't think about his family. I think he just thought about immediately in the second of, 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 that existence and he just made it right here everything was right here yeah. and it's yeah. it probably the only way he managed to do it because any shift or panic or anything would have just destroyed yeah. so but yeah um we talked about this is what we were talking about sorry and i copped some words too but um where are you at spiritually with your work you said you kind of went through the thing and then in 2015 you're dealt with the tragedy that you're still living with where are you at now with your art? What does the art do for you holistically? Yeah. So for, first off, the I discovered when I was going through the most acute period of um, the pain for my father's passing that um, art and drawing especially were really a more powerful force than I'd ever reckoned with before. Like, it's just that, you know, I, I'd had the... I'd had the luck of just not having that many difficult situations in my life before that, you know, I was just a very lucky guy who, you know, I was putting most of my problems on myself and uh, I was just sort of going through life and, you know, was youthful and things were going great. So um, I knew that art felt good and that there was certainly the feeling of losing yourself in the process and things like that. But experiencing that within the context of my father's passing and my grief over it really brought into stark relief. Like, oh my God, even though this is like, I feel crazy right now and I just feel so scared and I don't know what to think and life is chaos. And I'm like, I'm dealing with, I'd thought about mortality a lot before this, but it was never real. Like now now it was like, I was really thinking about mortality and what it means to go through life the way that you want and your emotions and and how you feel about your life. Like all of the big questions were really selling on me vividly and with reality for the first time. And yet still, if I sat down and drew, um, I felt good and I would still forget everything. You know, if I drew for 10 minutes, it would all slip away. Right. So, and again, that was an experience I'd always had, but I was like, now that's fucking weird. That's really weird. (laughs) So, um, so that made me really, that really made me start paying closer attention to the experiential side. Mm -hmm. And, um, now I'd, I'd already been, um, interested in meditation at this point in my life for quite, quite a bit, you know, I'd, I'd been meditating on and off, um, since I was, since I'd encountered those practices for the first time at like 14 ish, something like that. So, um, like I'd been dental kind of, or what kind of, what form of meditation? The ones that got me into it were, um, I would actually say my first introduction to it was some, what most people would consider like Advaita stuff, more, um, more influenced by that sort of the, 
basically when I was too young, I read uh, uh, an Eckhart Tolle book <laughs> about, um, uh, it was The Power of Now, Power it's of his now. most famous book. Yeah, yeah. My, my sister had it in her, at her place and I was visiting her hmm. and I just pulled it off the shelf and wow. I read it. Lightning yeah, bolt. And I, <laughs> it, I was like, what? I was a kid and I was like, what the fuck is this? It was, it was, how, how old were you? <laughs> I, I, if I remember correctly, uh, that was when I went to Comic-Con for the first time. So I was in San young. Diego? Yep, yeah, oh, I was nice. visiting her in San Diego. She was living there, so nice. uh, I was, I'm was. i pretty sure I was younger than 15. I'm not sure I can be more Good specific than to that. to have that book if your mind is ready for it. I think you can handle it at that age. Yeah. It's big, it's bigger than your than your reality has given you, but yeah. okay, cool. Yeah, Eckhart yeah. Tolle is The Power of Now is a... The, his book that book is so dense that I can just read a couple of pages and be good for like months. It is, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I, I, I don't often, complete those kind of books. I just kind of open them up randomly and I consume and I go, okay, that's good. It's like, yeah, it's like taking a piece of, of drug or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for absorb real. and permeate and then move forwards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that was my first. Um, well, is you know that kind of you know kind of non dual stuff is not really super advocating for like focus meditation, but it was really the first time my mind was open to like investigating the mind and like seeing what's going on in there. And then a couple years later, probably, um, I encountered uh, writings about Zen meditation. Mm -hmm. And that was my first like real gateway that that one that one really got me interested i especially like the koans uh these are these zen puzzles that are used in zen meditation teaching um i've never had a formal teacher so by most people's accounts i've never done a koan because they're supposed to be done in relationship with a teacher but mm -hmm. i read you know the collections i just loved them as literature i based a few projects off of them in college gave the uh gave some characters and college projects the names of the Zen teachers and their students and things like that. Mm. And um, I consumed that stuff. I really liked that stuff. And I started meditating around then just because I was very interested in what they were mm. saying. Um, so mm. I bring that up to say, when I had this new encounter and saw drawing in a new light after my father's passing, I started to realize that drawing was kind of the same thing. And that it's a lot of, of meditation. The, Indeed, and yeah. in, in fact, I, it's like, it was almost, I stopped seeing it as like a form of meditation, which I might've agreed, which I would have agreed with before that, but sort of in a light way, mm. I was like, I started, so in all the meditating I'd done, like, this is a stupid thing to say, but just to get the emotional valence of it, it's like, I was a bad meditator. I, <laughs> I, very, I experienced very little peace from meditation, even though I'd been doing it for years, I was doing it with a goal in mind, which is a slippery prospect at best uh, when you're doing meditation. Yeah. And most of my time was spent in what is really a classic meditative experience, which is that you're frustrated out of your fucking mind and you're sitting on a cushion you're thinking for hours at a time. So <laughs> I was, I was the always- first time a, I've heard somebody honestly have a, 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 a every, every, nobody ever says it like that. So thanks, you know? It's like, oh, dude, like yeah, it's, you are winning the yeah, meditative master. You're like what? I no. could, I've tried it so many times and I've just given up on the concept because my, my mind is full on monkey brain. like crazy all the time i i no i completely yeah i completely sympathize and <laughs> and it, it so that was my experience and i just i kept doing it on and off because i was you know like you said you've tried it and things like that. It's like you're interested you feel like there's something there there's something and there. for some for some reason you keep coming back but yeah from like i said probably around 14 ish is when i first started doing it and my father died around 25. I could not list many positive experiences from sitting there meditating. It was frustrating wall to wall. I, I felt, I mean, I was interested, but it, you know, I was hoping it would help. Cause like I said, I was burning out, mm. had bouts with depression from just pushing myself too hard. I was looking for a lot of what is promised about meditation, which is like Calmness. reducing stress, yeah. you know, things like that. And Inner harmony. Yeah. Indeed. And yeah. it just wasn't working. So, mm. When I saw drawing in this new light, I had this sort of mind blow moment where I was like, wait a second, I've been experiencing everything promised by meditation while drawing. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. I've, I've already, yeah. the, the, the destruction of self, the non-presence, the feelings of peace, like every, everything that was like, suddenly it all clicked, like everything I'd read in the koans and stuff like that, I was like, <laughs> that's right. all just the stuff that's been going on in, in drawing. So <laughs> that, that, that revelation was like a- Drawing's just a vessel, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it was, it turned out for me that it was like, that was my true gateway to those insights and to those experiences. And ironically enough, once I got that, then when I came back to sitting meditation later, then it was actually good because I had sort of, the weight was off. Like, but once drawing, once drawing had handled it for me, when I went back to sitting after that, then I was having my first positive experiences ever in all those years of doing it. Hmm. But that's, you know, that, that's a whole rabbit hole. But um, that's so, beautiful. so all of this is to say that my father's death put me on a road of reanalyzing what I was doing with my favorite thing in life, which was making art, hmm. made me realize there was something deeper there going on for me that I had sort of been ignoring lightly, you know, lightly ignoring. And I was almost like, my God, what have I done? Like, what, what, what was I, how, how was I missing this? So mm-hmm. that then made me start asking, uh, sort of scrutinizing the lens and being like, what have I been missing in art? Like, what, what, what else have I been ignoring? Why, why have I made almost thoughtlessly the choices about what I'm gonna do with it that I have made over all of these years? Mm-hmm. Um, so I began unraveling those things. I really started asking myself, like, do I really want to be a commercial artist? You know, was that really just a product of necessity mm-hmm. and sort of the hierarchy of needs where it's like, I, I hypnotized myself into mm-hmm. thinking I wanted to be a commercial artist because I needed to pay bills and get food, you know? Yes. And that turned out to be true for wow. the most part. That and wow. um, what a conversation to have, and also to be honest about the outcome of that answer. <laughs> yeah, it's real, man. Yeah, I, I'm not going to deny any of that stuff. That I mean, those those Appreciate experiences. How open you are. This is great. <laughs> hey, I mean, it's. I think it's important because I think a lot of people are going to these things are going to repeat. People are going to go through these things over and over again. So, yes. and we whatever, all must take our own journey too. No matter what's yeah. said here, everybody that's listening must take their own journey falling yeah. on their own face. So you had this conversation yeah. where you realized that you hypnotized yourself into doing what you thought you were supposed to be doing. And yeah. you were ballsy enough to realize that your MO is not what your MO is. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. very, that's very yeah. good. I like I, that. I re- I, when I, when I, when I realized that again, I was like, yeah. it was cold chills and oh, it was shit. a lot of night. It was a lot of nights of being like, <laughs> Well, well, if I'm shit, not this, what am I? <laughs> exactly. I was like, well, what do I, what, what do I do now? Yeah. You know, I've got to act on this. So, when, when did you have this midlife? You had a quarter this, life. <laughs> this probably would have been around. What I must have been going through this about a year after my father died. So, so it's probably 2016. So yeah, 26, 27, somewhere around there. Yeah. Hey, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, dude, there was, yeah. and there, you know, I mean, when, when you've got a big, like when, when, when the trigger that's fueling all of these things is something as big as like my dad's death, like what I went through, it's like, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, sure. and it was stuff that had to do with art and stuff that didn't have to do with art and things like that. So, um, I, I started asking a lot of questions and I started reevaluating a lot of what I thought was important what I was doing, things I had rejected, things I had accepted, um, questioning my motivations for things, questioning in light of these things, what would be a way to move forward with my life that as best as I could guess, you know, cause like we said, like you don't know, you know, and that was one of the things that I had learned from my experience with my father was like, you can never be quite sure. You know, you think you want something now, you're not sure you're gonna want it later. Um, and paradox of choice. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, so as best as I could guess, what life would I actually want? You know, and and I didn't have a lot of great answers, but one one of the things that wound up, and this is a couple years after, but one of the things that wound up coming out of it was that I realized that these questions and the things that we've been discussing, w- those were on their own 
very important to me. Mm. And at that point, I'd spoken with enough artist friends and also I'd taken some students at that point. And when I took, at this point, I was teaching people one on one, you know, and I had really quickly found out I'd gone in like, I'll teach these people how to, you know, shade like I do, draw like I do, whatever. And it was like, I found really quickly, we were hardly ever talking about that stuff in our calls. Um, not because I wasn't willing to talk about it, but because the they were expressing mental blockages about art that it turned out because of the experiences I'd been through, I had a lot to say about. Mm. And um, so I knew those were important on their own. And then I, again, I didn't quite know what to do with that, but I took a step, I was like, I think I'll make a YouTube channel that anybody would advise me not to make and I'll just talk about these things on there. Mm -hmm. So I, I, so that was around 2019. Uh, I think it was October or something like that. And, um, I made this YouTube channel and, uh, I I was like, I'm not going to fall into the traps like that I had fallen into before. Um, they're traps for me. They're not traps for other people, but I was like like, going like, what's up guys. And being a used car salesman, even well, that was an obvious one. Definitely was not going to do that though. It does sound fun, honestly, sometimes, but, um, (laughs) but, uh, the, uh, the other stuff was like, you know, not going in for, um, like tutorials, like it would have been very easy. You know, an artist, when you're launching a YouTube channel, the first assumption is like, I'm going to, you know, how to draw a head, how to draw hands, things like that. Sure. And, when I analyzed these new things I'd come to, I was like, oh no, I, that that's not gonna work for me. That's not actually what I wanna do. And that sucks, cause that's you know what algorithms support and things like that. And it's gonna mean, it's gonna take longer to grow. But I was just like, who cares? It's fine if nobody's watching. Uh, and I was just really trying to make my choices instead of the unscrutinized way I'd made them before, I was trying to make them carefully and I was trying to align them with these new things that I had learned about myself and really trying to make things work with my personal values. Mm. So I just talked about these weird things that I had learned and the experiences that I'd been through and I drew a little bit on there and I got, I mean, the so many of those early videos are like, if I had shown them to anybody, any kind friend would have been like, don't fucking post that. Don't, <laughs> that's nobody wants to hear that. That's not what you should be talking about. Um, And, uh, but it worked slowly. People started, you know, they gravitated towards it. You know, when you're being honest, that really helps a lot of the time. People really naturally gravitate towards that. And, and that started building up my YouTube and, um, that just changed so much. You know, it, it really made me feel more aligned with the practice because what I was putting out there about it was aligned with what I was feeling instead of ignoring what I was feeling. I was connecting with other people about it. And then as the ball rolled on, then it was also making me connections. I was meeting people. Yeah, um, I was able to get more students. So now there was the possibility of making more of a living off of that as well. And, um, you know, it, it's just, I, I have a very weird journey to thank for all of that. And um, so now, this is such a long answer to your question, but- I love it though, thank you. That has has resulted in a a practice right now where I've been able to be honest about these weird things that I feel about art and the meditative qualities of it and the gateways that it can show you to insights about the self and how we go through life. while drawing whatever I want, basically, and integrating the parts of my personality that enjoy talking to people and making people feel good and performing a little bit and writing, you know, that was something that I've always liked doing that was not ever really in the commercial art world. You know, I was only ever drawing. Now I got to write about these things and just Mm. incorporate writing. and, And the students, I found that the students were, damn, students can't be beat if you align with them and if you like teaching it's like students are so non-cynical you know it's like they're at the beginning they're they they're pure and their intentions for art are so pristine Hmm. it's like i don't know how else to describe it it's like after you've worked with clients for long enough and there's lots of great clients in the world for the record everyone but Hmm. it's like 
You have to design Dude. your clients too, just like your dog trains your like you know we have dogs, Dude. but dogs are training us. You know, so that's a just, great way to put it, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's but a but street. Yeah. But the beautiful thing about students is that like, if you if you like the that that pureness, it's like pfft, it's like pure drugs. It's like raw, the most diluted, just hit of just like when you're in that space with students, it's like. Oh, it's like, it's back in month one, you know, it's like, it's the really pure untainted version of it. And, um, it's hard I found to teach art, huh? I feel like it's hard to teach art. I always is. had a hard time. Like when people are like, can you critique this? I'm like, man, where do I start? Because it's all about your intention, where you're going. What do you want? What are you trying to get yeah. out of it? How do you feel? What it makes you feel, you know, it's like, oof. cause you also, you could destroy somebody's person, you know, if you're not careful yes. in, in, in teaching is really difficult with art. Cause you can be so destructive with whether you mean to or not. And I, I was talking to a friend last night and I was describing one of my favorite artists. His style came from him just being authentic. I, I we can talk about this too. I think I would, I'm actually curious. I think that style comes from all your failures that you've mm -hmm. overcome. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. I think that's literally what your style yeah. is. Yeah. I think that that's included. Well, I, I I, it's not just failures. There are also positive sort of intent things people did with intent in sure. their style. But um, I think all of the failures are included. Yeah, well, what, all, all, all everything you've overcome ha is definitely included. Yeah. That's your style. I, at least that's I summation. Because uh, I think to myself and I go, why am I doing what I'm doing? And why did I didn't, I'm up here? Because when I was growing up, I would idolize like Todd McFarlane and all these guys. Oh, I want to draw spine and do these things. And you know, like Otomo and Akira and all these things. And then I realized like, I just don't have that hand. I can draw like them if I really wanted to, but then I'm just aping them and I'm not contributing at all to myself or the world of art. So yeah. I realized there's a different path. And one time I was at Comic-Con and I was talking, talking to Mike Mignola. He's one of my favorite artists because of this very thing. So if you're not familiar, if you're listening, Mike Mignola is a guy that created Hellboy. He has a very specific art style. And him and like Frank Miller, they have a very, I mean, all of these guys have a very unique thing. And he was kind of talking almost casually downplaying his art style, comparing itself to like other artists. And he was saying that he's just lazy. But mm -hmm. I started really analyzing, I started asking him questions. And because when he was coming up, this is the dawn of like the Jim Lees and all these guys that were hyper detailed and Travis Charest and these wonderful uh, Jeff Darrow's and all these things that these artists that had this incredible knack of just adding all detail and the page is just like filled with just detail and you get a lot yeah. of production value. Mike said he was lazy and didn't want to draw the windows of every building. And so he found a way to like block things in. But if you look at his art, especially depend on where you look at it in his career, he found a way to distill. So he did all his, he was just, he was failing he was trying to be that person, but then because he, he even did some like old Batman comics and like you could see he was like doing hash marks and stuff. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. He was Jim Lee was having or all these guys, you know, Jack Kirby and all these guys were having this influence on his art style. But he eventually distilled and became his own person. If you watch his, like because I, I have I tracked his whole I was looking at his art studying. It. I was like, wow, look at the change here that happened and look at that big leap. And and now he's now he's got other artists that are aping him that are working under him. And it's this weird, crazy thing. But. Um, but anyways, what I was saying is I feel like style comes from, at least for me, and, and you can say, like you said, like it can come from other things, but what is a, what's opposite of failure is success. And it's, and what I mean by failure is that you're trying and whatever yeah. rises to the surface is what you take with you, you know, right. and critiquing a, a student. It's like, for me, I always had a hard time. So it's like, just fail, keep failing and let's see what rises to the surface. You know, let's yeah. see what version of you is different from me, is different from everybody else. And what do you carry and bring to this plethora ecosystem of the hive mind of creativity, which is, you know, fascinating too. So yeah. anyways, tangent, tangent thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of many. <laughs> but a beautiful one. And, and it is hard. It is hard to teach. I feel very fortunate that um, I, I had shied away from teaching because of those specific problems yeah. for a very long time. I thought it wouldn't be for me because I was intimately aware of that. I'm like, well, how, you know, I, I, I'm always very concerned with the big picture in art. So it was like, am I really just gonna jump in in this one little moment of someone's career and just critique one picture and possibly fuck them up? Because I've known many 
personal experiences with teachers where they just say one thoughtless thing and then that's all you think about for a year. You know, it happens yeah. all the time. <laughs> so I was very, very, very aware of that. Mm. So I felt very lucky to sort of find by surprise that the YouTube kind of gave me a selection effect. It was like mm -hmm. a self-selecting set where mm -hmm. people were only coming to me if they had sort of felt and connected with the base message. Mm -hmm. And then that was solving a lot of that for me. I, I was having very sophisticated discussions with my students because they they got that. They weren't they weren't coming in naive about those mm -hmm. things. They they were they already got it. They were like, I know this is just one image. I want to talk about the meta thing. Like what is some students don't want to talk about a picture at all. They're they just want like more like the coaching thing. Like I, I need to figure out what's holding me back from the past or fears in the future. And sure. um, that that made teaching possible for me. And I was surprised when I found that was happening. I was like, that's great. That's, that's, that's uh, I did not see that coming. Mm. Yeah. I like that a lot. That's really cool. Yeah. I didn't think about that part of it too, but it's good. It's actually, a wonderful it, thing. Yeah, good, what is true? Like by you putting yourself out there. And I always say that the future of our currency is authenticity. All we want is to be loved mm. and heard and, and, and understood in this life. And I think when, when somebody is out there so being important. vulnerable and sharing themselves with the others and, you know, cause like when, when you had made the video on the, on your pers your, your perspective of the AI art, like mm. it's really hard to maintain somebody's focus more than ever. And I think it's because there's a lot of bullshit out there, but when mm. there's good stuff, it's easy to listen to it. Like I'll listen to a great conversation of a podcast for hours because if it's great, it engages me and people are being authentic when you were going on and you were talking about it, I just like fully engaged. And I was like, the only thing that stopped me, I was like, I need to start sharing this with friends and, 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 and let, let them get into this because these are, these are interesting permeating thoughts that you're bringing to the table. And it was nice, really, man. the thing I really liked about it is people got really polarized, um, yeah. which is, this is a very polarizing topic. You know, the thing that you were touching on, which I think is, which I think as I love, I, I was talking to my friend, Chris Byer last night and, 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 he, and we're like, this is so complicated. And I told him every day I feel I'm on two sides of the conversation, one pro, yeah. one against. And I think that the reason why I am, and I'm talking about AI art now is because it's, it, it kills, it, it gives death and it gives life at the same time, yeah. but it's doing it so viciously and so rapidly and so fast. And, and we don't, our little monkey brains cannot get past how complicated this is going to be. Not just now, but looking five to 10 years down of what art is for humanity and all these kind of things. I would love yeah. to propose some pro AI stuff. Cause I know that you're not just anti and I think it's probably good for us mm -hmm. to talk about that, but also the downside and all these unethical things that are happening and we can kind of showcase those. I know you've talked a bit about them, so I don't know if you mm -hmm. want to beat that down, but in a perfect world, let's say that this AI art comes into our lives and and it's doing what people are hoping it's doing which is giving therapy to those that need it in your mind what's a perfect look at how this could actually evolve the human race forwards basically by using this tool i mean that yeah a very grand question for sure it's and the biggest yeah yeah so in some in some respect it's so extreme and depending on what you believe is possible with it um almost anything is on the table which is completely freaky right so if if you if you are an an ai optimist right so personally i've said this elsewhere but yes i'm at this point and the message that i'm trying to get there yeah no one most people would not say i'm an ai optimist that i'm yeah. against them and that i have a lot of problems with them and i definitely do but if i remove myself from it, if I remove my personal viewpoint, I consider myself an optimist because I believe they can do a lot of things and not everybody agrees. A lot of people think they'll stop progressing or that there's certain things that they can't do. Um, I'm actually, this is crazy to say, but it's like, I'm basically all there on what's possible. Like I personally, a lot of people right away are going to get off the wagon here, but it's like, I personally believe you could make a sentient machine. I think you could manufacture a consciousness. So of course you um, can. I mean, it's on its way. <laughs> indeed, but not yeah. everybody agrees. A lot of people, oh, that's you know, weird. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people think that uh, 
there is something special about the wetware of the human biology and that there you, is. you yeah. need it. Yeah. Well, it, it's certainly, I feel very special inside yeah. of mine. Well, it's and ego it's like, death too, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, we're gonna get into big there, topics. I know, <laughs> I right, right off the bat. But, but I do okay, love so let, that you have the mind because I feel like if you're willing to look into the future, you must look at it through your lens and out of your lens. And, and I'm trying to. And the biggest mind that you can possibly have because the, the future is for the biggest mind. You know, the future is for those that it's like beauty is in the idea holder. Future is in the mind that can, can like can, can take it all in because it's literally yeah. going to be everything all at once. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy. But you have to. I, I feel I mean, I don't know. You could do whatever you want. But if you want to embrace the future, I feel like you must be like, wow, wow. Like, you know, what what are we doing? <laughs> and, yeah. and really shake that and ask yourself, you know, holistically, what are you doing? What is your impact? You know, where are you at in this world spiritually? You know, um, but yeah. sorry, you, so I you agree. were saying that people are, I, I guess that makes sense that people would say that there's no sentient being or the possibility because, because we are unique and special. And I a hundred percent agree that we are very unique and very special, but we're all very, very simple. Um, and very repetitive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, so, okay. So yeah, so I consider, I think I hold the optimist position in that, um, I, if we had to define a room and people would be like, can you make a, a conscious being out of silicone? I'd walk to the side of the room that says yes. Right. My, my gut tells me that there is some amount of input, output and information processing that can be done in a system that makes it feel like there is something it is like to be that system. Yeah. I'm not a scientist, no the, no one has an answer to that. Yeah. I'm just saying that that all seems to add up to me based on my personal experience. Um, so I'm an optimist. Mm -hmm. And if, if, you're, if you're asking the question you asked from that position to people who also hold that position, almost anything is on the table. Yes. If, if, what, if, what, a, if what AI is, is a precursor to something like a conscious being made fresh by a technological race whose nature is completely malleable, right? We <laughs> we could bear we couldn't call it human. It's no, something it's beyond it, us. It's it's something else. Yeah. Almost anything's on the table. That is a gateway to well, it's a gateway to a lot of things. That's the problem. It's a gateway <laughs> to utter destruction or it's a gateway to utter glory. Both. If you can get an insane amount of things right to go to, towards the glory direction. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I, I personally feel that way. Um, if we're realistically looking down that hole, any kind of sci-fi good thing is possible. You know, you, you can make an infinitude of simulations of whatever you want for an infinity of people. You can try to maximize joy and pleasure in the world. You can try to do things like remove scarcity. Um, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, the problem is that those things do fry the mind. You know, it's like, it's, it's if what's much. on the table, it's an infinity of good is what people who are positing on the utopian angle. Mm. And if we, it's, it seems to me clear that it's always the case that if we want that outcome, there's more things we need to make sure we have a lot of sheep that we need to herd. There's a <laughs> lot of spots where that could go horribly wrong. Oh, yeah. And we need to do an insane amount of adjustments and cut this off here, cut this off there, cut this off here, cut this off there. Yeah. And personally, and not everybody agrees with me, the prospect of doing that in a way that everybody agrees with in our current world troubles me. I, I'm not sure we could pull it off right now. Mm. Uh, I, I have a lot of worries about what it would take and what we would need to go through for that to go that way positively. Yeah. But um, all of that to say, yeah, uh, just to be clear about my position, because of what I believe is possible with, I know I know that we're extrapolating way beyond text to image models here. Oh yeah, right? we have but, to. I mean, because this is just yeah. the start of it. <laughs> we're literally opening, we're lifting the rug right now. We're lifting just the f one corner of it because it's it's yeah. it doesn't just stop here and it doesn't start here and it doesn't end here. It's the beginning of this bigger conversation. And um, 
But yeah, I love that you, I, I feel like there's not to be an echo chamber here, but, and I, I want to definitely pose both sides of things. Cause I feel like one of the things that I've realized through my network of friends and artists and collectives and creatives is that there's this big shift between the two worlds. And I sympathize and empathize with both sides because I can see it. People that are afraid of it, they're gonna, they say, you know, why am I doing art anymore? Or why should I even study? Or why should I go to college? Or this thing's better than me already? And, and, and so on and so forth. So I have to, and I see that and go, that, that, that sucks to be in that headspace. Yeah. And I don't want, I don't like that they're suffering and that bothers me, you know, that Same. this is creating chaos for them internally and emotionally. And I don't have refuge for that other than you need to understand your relationship to art intrinsically in a spiritual form. And then your answers come from there. Then on the other side, we see this thing that is helping people through therapy, artists that were never artists that can now become artists, which is quite brilliant. And there's all these different use case studies. I was thinking like the other day, like what if somebody gets attacked by somebody and all they have is a memory, but they can use this machine to f like basically character sketch the person and go like, mm -hmm. that's basically the person that caused me harm and that that can help them find whatever that that's just like one little user case scenario. But on the other side of the pro side of it, which is like this machine that is almost an ensemble of something and how powerful that could be because you're just using thoughts and your thoughts become some sort of a, of a reality, which is fascinating. I don't know. It's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's again, there's, there's these, all these things, but I'm definitely on the side of optimism as well. But yeah, I, I also agree. We're not ready for that. If you look at like, the state of the politics of just America as itself, it's so broken and it's so shattered. And I mean, racism is rampant and it's all these weird things. You're like, these are like binary mind systems. Like guys, like, how is this even a relevant thing in this time? Like how is this yeah. happening? But it's mainly because we're just unevolved really. And most of us mm -hmm. are emotionally um, uh, just futile or not we're just not good <laughs> we have a lot we have a lot to go which which i think yeah. that's what's been great about this is i think it's getting a lot of people to have an existential crisis and think about who they are and what they're doing and why they're doing it yeah. and um you know and it's forcing them literally to say like hey uh wake up because your your whole life is getting turned upside down and whatever's sticking um is what's going to last and Sometimes you need that in life though, too, spiritually and just all of the things, but yeah. yeah. It's one of, it's the scariest thing to happen in art for a long time, but it's also the most interesting thing to happen in art for a long time. There's yeah. no denying that. There's I, no denying that. I thought NFTs were disruptive. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. yeah. Oh and God, I saw this coming like, down the road too, cause I was, I was an early adopter just looking into it and investigating it. Vitaly, I think was the first one to show me this stuff. And he's always on the cutting edge of these things, uh, Vitaly mm -hmm. Bogorov. And he was kind of showing me this stuff. And I was like, what the hell is this? And then I started looking into it and I was like, how is this possible? And then Mache started getting into it. And then, and everybody, and then started, and it's weird that just recently, it seems like the world just saw it. And I feel like, um, I've been aware of it since like disco diffusions, like very early, like times, I guess. And that's literally because of mm -hmm. my social my circles and I'm like, how is this happening? How is this working? And then kind of discovering how and why and the ethics of it all and stuff is, Oh, okay. Now I see. Cause at first it's a magic trick um, yep. and you use it and you, and if you've not used it before, for those who are listening, you, you, you put these words in a form of prompt and, um, and then you extrapolate those things. And the, basically the prompt kind of data, it just kind of rakes all the data on the internet unethically and then spits out something to you and it's it's literally like a google search of the future where it, it gives you closer to what you're looking for um which is fascinating uh, well i, I do want to i do want to jump in there just to please. give a little but because what what you said is um correct in a sense but i do i do want to just make sure that we get the more nuanced um yeah, version of the technology there I, I just want to be clear that when you prompt it at the point of prompting, it is not at that point scraping the entire internet. Mm. It's you can run something like stable diffusion, for example, local on a computer unplugged from the internet. That's right. Um, That's correct. Yeah. The, what, what's, what is happening is that now surely they do need to scrape everything. They scrape different companies. And this is part of the ethics is that there's 
different companies organized in different ways, feeding each other different forms of data. And that creates situations that someone like me would say are data laundering, are ways to get around laws uh, like text and data mining exemptions that allow companies to scrape the internet for copyrighted materials so long as they're used for research and nonprofit purposes. It seems to me that those arms that are doing it as nonprofit and then extending those data sets to the for-profit companies that are also funding their the research of the nonprofit uh, have really found a pretty clear loophole that I would say is dangerous to allow as a precedent. Mm. But these data sets are used to condition the capability of these models, the art that we see come out of them. Mm. The, the business end of that is something that is pretty complicated, but interesting to look into, which is that these models produce a latent space. And the latent space is what you navigate as a user by using a random seed number and a prompt. Mm -hmm. So you put in a random seed number or the model that you're using gives you one, just doesn't let you access it. You put in your prompt and then those two things sort of provide a coordinate within the latent space, which is a locked space. Once you're interacting with the model, the latent space is not changing. And those coordinates then produce the generations that you're going to get. Um, if that all sounded complicated, I apologize to everybody. It is complicated. Please keep going. I love this because <laughs> I'm getting schooled on it too. Because I look, I look, I almost know it from a very high looking at it far away because I've not spent the time to le read the legal and all these things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, please keep going because it's really good for us to be educated. And I think that's one of the thing I would say yeah. that it, it, the biggest compliment I can give you is that video. It just it was you had your opinions, but you also backed it up with facts that you are discovering and finding along the way as you're going through it. And I think it's a very important Thank thing you. to say here is that sure, we all have biases and we all have our own agendas here. My personal agenda is to evolve the conversation. And I said that yeah. from the, whether you're pro or against it, I would love to actually have David, the guy that started MJ on and, and talk to him about mm -hmm. his thought. I don't know if that's going to be good for him <laughs> to get him to be openly talking about these things and how abru abruptly uh, disruptive this is and potentially uh, legal problems. But anyways, yeah. so you're saying when a user, a human um, interacts with this, what would you, what would you call this thing? The let's, I mean, maybe we should be more yeah. specific too. which one we should identify. Are we talking about mid journey sure. or diffusion or dolly or I, I tend to talk about uh, stable diffusion okay. because it, it has the most, it has this extra aspect that the other ones don't have, which is that it was released open source. Mm, so that's right. Most of, most of what you can say about stable diffusion will apply to the other popular models, but, um, this open source discussion is not relevant to the other models. Okay. Um, Mid Journey, Imogen, Dolly, they're not open source. They are, um, they have not disclosed it. Right. Yep. And they're, they're, they're not sharing their numbers like Netflix doesn't share their numbers. So, right. Indeed. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and many of them haven't even disclosed what their data sets are, mm -hmm. which has, is this is coming probably, from that company that starts with an L? Well, Lion, yes. Lion yeah. is, um, okay. So, um, <laughs> but like a, Okay, so to, for anybody who hasn't caught these discussions, um, in, in the case of stable diffusion, um, which is made by a company called Stability AI, and this goes for a lot of the other um, image models, here's sort of the workflow for acquiring the data. So first, there is a nonprofit called Common Crawl that scrapes the internet indiscriminately for, I believe, all sorts of stuff. But one of the things that they scrape for is images and the associated text descriptions that go with the image. So, the question, sorry, I'm gonna yes. interject a couple of times. So this company, the, this is a, a freelancing company that does this service for just gathering data sets, basically, they're mining, is that what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and they. I think at that point, we could say they're doing it for research purposes, as okay. far as I know. I, I don't know too many details about Common Crawl, but they would be a nonprofit. I'm pretty sure they're a nonprofit, and uh, oh, God, they're doing I, it for I research I cringe purposes. when I hear those two words, um, <laughs> simply because it's like, it's so misleading, and it's like, come on, we, gotta, we, need, we need another fucking set of words for this nonprofit crap, because it's not, and it's so like, all right. <laughs> yeah, once just, you pop- It's almost like Firefest or something. It's like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once you pop the hood and you look into what it takes to be a nonprofit, all yeah. sorts of stuff is possible. Yeah, so. yeah which is crazy. I mean, and some, I'm not saying that all pro nonprofits are bad. Of course not. There's some mm -hmm. incredible ones, but 
um, and when I hear that. So um, just to get this correct. So, and I don't know, this is Common Crawl, right? This is a company called Common yes. Crawl. So they're, they're employing some sort of like special sauce recipe of AI that's mining and, and grabbing just data and then they're compart- would, compiling it or do you know? I would I would say that even... Is this um, factual too or is this hypothetical? I'm just asking questions and, and you're not an employee yeah. there, so yeah. <laughs> no, I, I did just look it up. They are a nonprofit, but um, the um, I, I believe what they're doing, you wouldn't even call it an AI, you'd just call it a bot. It's yeah. a bot that is just sort of literally almost like what Google does to spider the internet so that it's searchable. Yeah. Common crawl is just sort of glacially moving through the internet and just scooping things up. Text yeah. here, images here. And I assume that they offer a variety of like, here's a set of images, here's a set of words, here's, you know, I don't know, UI elements or something like that. Sure. And they are allowed to do this because of, and this all gets caught up with precedential legal stuff and exemptions that various jurisdictions have made because it changes whether you're in the US, in the EU, all sort of different countries and jurisdictions have different rules about these things, but they're allowed to do this because of precedential laws that allow for mining of this sort or scraping of this sort mm. if you're doing it for nonprofit or research purposes. Okay. Yeah. So, he, so, here's, so that's step one in the pipeline. Okay, now, great. weirdly enough, now we have a company called Lion, yeah. which takes- Not spelled what, as Lion though, right? It's L-A-I-O-N. Yeah, I, yeah. I believe it stands for something, but I actually don't know what it stands for. Mm. So Lion, another nonprofit based in Germany, I believe, they then take what Common Crawl has made publicly available, these scrapes, mm. and they sort of curate them and repackage them. So Lion takes what Common Crawl has done and puts it into a variety of data sets. So the, one of the most popular ones being talked about these days is Lion 5B, which stands for 5 billion. So it's a data set of 5 billion images that have been collected by Common Crawl, but now Lion is packaging them and redistributing them. And a lot of the other services that they offer are like um, stuff that I don't get to like, I'm pretty sure it's like, it's coding stuff. It's like, they're not just repackaging. It's like, they're making it easy for code to then interact with it further down the mm-hmm. line for AI purposes. But I hope, I, I would hope that professionals would correct me on that misunderstanding. Mm-hmm. Cause it is a little bit hard to filter through what these companies actually do, unless you can read code a lot of it in a lot of the time. Yeah. And they probably wouldn't tell this because that's their secret sauce. So, and that's where their value is. And, and, and understandably, I get that. Have you spoken to anybody at Lion directly? I have not, mm. but, um, and, and I, I can't, I can't give more detail than that, but, um, I've spoken with people who have spoken with Lion, um, mm. and, and, um, yeah, but, um, okay. not, not that, not in any, like, significant capacity. It's not so most like of I, the data you're retracting or getting from is from word of mouth, potentially people talking, and then also the words that you're reading from what Lion says that they're doing, right? Which yes. is to be, to be clear, whenever I'm discussing this stuff, I really am uh, just to be perfectly forthright. Like I do know stuff from the background field just because my video sort of went all over the place. So mm. I've gotten a lot of messages, you know, and people sending me information, but, um, you're like the Epstein this, guy? I basically Epstein. don't, I, I don't, um, when, I'm, when I'm talking like this, I don't um, include that stuff because it's, it's, it's just obviously more important for me. Most of what you're going to hear me say comes from me reading their own websites, the websites that yeah. these companies have, uh, what they say about. That's what I was themselves. clarifying, just for those that are listening and also just for people that might be like, yeah, 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 whatever. It's like, no, like, let's, 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 let's hear what you're saying here because I think that... Yeah there's value. It's just a matter of like identifying because I, the way I look at the internet is it's just filled with noise and it's so hard to perceive what is really going on. And I kind of look at it like I do with Fox news or something. It's like, and I try my best, but at the same time, I'm like, who wrote these words? What do they mean? Are they, is this the truth? And you know, like all of those kind of things. And then the truth is variable. So yeah. Oh, sorry. You cut out for a second. You're oh, back. sorry about that. Oh, you're Hang back. Um, okay. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt and I will do it multiple times. So I apologize no, ahead fine. of time, but I just wanted Perfectly to make fine. sure. So as we're going through this, so you're talking about lion. So lion mm-hmm. employs what uh, common crawl does. And yeah, basically well, common crawl has it. put it out. As far as I know it, common crawl has sort of put it out there. They're like, well, sure. we're for research. So it's got to be publicly accessible. So gotcha. they, 
they put it out there. Lion uses that to produce these products. So they have multiple. So they have something like Lion 5B, 5 billion images, Lion 400 mil. So that's 400 million images. And there's different things that go on. You know, some of the, the sets are curated differently. And again, what these data sets are, are links to images and the associated text that is within the image. So I just want to be clear here as well that a Lion data set, as far as I understand it, does not actually contain the images. It contains URLs to oh. the images. Mm. And then it is the AI training company, so in this case, Stable Diffusion, they access the images when they train their model. So they use the links to go look at the images and they train the model with that. Mm. So, okay, interesting. Let's, and that link, is there a metadata attached to the image as well? Is that, do you I, know about that? I don't believe so. Mm, okay. um, again, I, I would hope professionals would correct me on any of that. I believe the only things in those data sets are the URLs to the image mm. and then the text associated with the image. Mm. So if, if, for example, it, it's an image on Pinterest, which is one of the biggest sites in the data sets. There's a lot of images on Pinterest. Yeah. Um, it will be a link to that image on Pinterest and then also whatever the descriptive text may be, like mm -hmm. High Fantasy Painting by Greg Rakowski or something like that. Sure. And th those can be by turns extremely specific or very long or very vague or outright wrong and mm -hmm. things like that. Okay, great. The, the, the important thing to know at this point that, that we're at in the workflow or in the pipeline is that most of these images are collected indiscriminately because of their understanding of the text and data mining exemptions, they really are not incentivized to try to filter things out. And the data sets are too huge. It's yeah. like, how would, it's very how do you difficult. That? Yeah, exactly. Five so, billion, it's like, wow. You know, how do you a, find one out of five billion and say that that's not allowed to be seen? It boggles the mind. It would yeah. be very difficult. And in all practicality- well, Yeah, I could do it, that maybe. <laughs> indeed, it would need to be some other automated system to actually just look through them. And that opens up more problems. But yeah. it's important to know that they're mostly scraped indiscriminately mm. and, um, and there's all sorts of stuff. So it's not just art, it's photographs. It's also not like just art photographs. It's just real world photographs, pictures yeah. of just people, social media photos, pictures of people's real estate, you know, cause they're scraping from all sorts of websites. Yeah. Um, and there's, yeah, every kind of thing in there, both stuff that is innocuous and stuff that is worrying, like people's private data, medical imagery, um, things that they wish were not in the data set, like pornography and things like that. And um, much of this is, of course, you know, if you're scraping like that, a lot of it is going to be people's work, copyrighted creative work as well. So we're two layers deep now. So we've got Common Crawl, scrapes the data set, then you go to Lion that packages it, mm -hmm. and then you have a company like Stability AI, which makes Stable Diffusion amongst other AI products. They then take what Lion has offered up and they use that to train a text to image model, which as Ash described, takes input from a user in the form of a natural language prompt and then produces images. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the tough part about these machine learning systems is that, and it's the professionals who say this, not me, is that no one quite knows exactly how they work. That's the magic of them. They, something in the alchemical process in the middle is a little bit of a mystery to us. So that means that there's always going to be a little bit of like a gray area stopgap when we decide these things where right there in the middle, there might be no one alive who knows exactly what's going on right there. <laughs> but in my, in my artist level knowledge, um, when you train the model, you begin the process and it starts going through the data set and it does a process right now called reverse diffusion. That is the, the state of the art process right now. Mm -hmm. So, oh boy, <laughs> what, yes. what, what, what reverse diffusion is doing is that basically you give the model versions of images that have noise added to them. So think mm -hmm. Photoshop noise, like the noise you might add with a Photoshop filter. Sure. And you slowly teach the model how to remove the noise mm. from the photograph. Actually, it's, it's kind of like what a, a, a renderer does anyways. It's noisy at first and then it resolves itself. Yeah. That's that's a great way to think about it. So um, in this process, 
which I'm sorry if I slipped up, you know, I, uh, in, this is in, big this stuff, is, so it's all good. And I do really yeah. appreciate you schooling us on this and your approach to like what you've learned from it. So I do definitely, it's awesome. Yeah. So. We're we're definitely in the technicals here, but for anyone yeah. who's interested, so yeah, hold on, um, baby. Yeah, we're on YouTube now. <laughs> yeah. I think we're posting YouTube. So like, create an open forum conversation, and and if you have facts and links, don't post like, yeah, try not to post odd opinions, but like if you have cool <laughs> stuff for us all to read and like, please share it yeah. with us. So the right, so. I do I do want to say so if if anyone who's checking out for me explaining it, uh, the Vox video which that's a great you one. Send me. yeah, that yeah. one's very good. I especially like the diagrammatic explanation of the latent space, which is so good. what we're heading towards here. Yeah. I would highly recommend anybody watch that one. This um, is the that sentient makes it very brain clear. right here. We're getting to like what we <laughs> think the, the potential sentient brain or the, the the special sauce recipe that we're talking about. The sauce, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it basically first it learns how to, I forget right now, but it, you know, it, it's either it learns how to add noise to images or how to remove noise from mm -hmm. images. Mm -hmm. And then because math can be run forwards and backwards, once it has learned that, you can run it backwards. Mm -hmm. So you can give it noise and it can try to remove the noise to get to a noiseless image. And, oh boy, if you put weights and parameters on it, it will try to remove the noise from a gray field, which is actually the seed number that you're using when you prompt these things. The seeds yeah. are not just a random number. They actually represent a beginning noise field yeah. for the model to work with. It tries to remove. Sorry, sorry, I'm totally messing you up. But the, okay. the, this, the concept of a seed is similar to like inside of a, a 3D program when you create a fractal noise, you create a seed number or any kind of fractal infinite math equation. When you put a seed, is that basically kind of creating an odd occurrence in that like growth cycle? Is that what it is? Is it kind of attached to that kind of math, the fractal kind of math noise I'm, seed kind of thing? Because that's how I'm seeing it. Because when yeah. I use like cinema or even After Effects, you can create a fractal noise and then you have seed, basically you change the seed and it completely shifts how the yeah. math is looking at something. I, I'm just, I don't know um, if that's what you meant by seed. I'm, I'm going to be, I don't know enough about what the actual math is in something like cinema to say that they're one-to-one. -one. Sure. I wouldn't be surprised uh, if that was the case. But um, in these models, the seed is, um, it. I want to be clear that the seed is not like random. It's like whatever the seed number is, like, you know, they're much longer than this, but let's say you're playing with seed number 15, right? Mm -hmm. Seed number 15 is always the same seed every time you come back to it. And that's going to be relevant because that means that if you use the same seed number and the same prompt, you will always get the exact same generations oh, out really? of the models. Hmm. Yes, indeed. Ah, so didn't know that. And that didn't know you so could that, get the same thing twice. Indeed. So, and that's kind of what I want to work up to here. So, yeah. um, so it learns how to denoise noise seeds mm -hmm. and the rails that they put on it, which are synonymous with the prompt, make it denoise towards something it's familiar with in heavy air quotes that it's familiar with. So mm -hmm. it tries to denoise the noise seed such that it looks like a banana. And it knows how to do that because it has removed the noise from many bananas before in the training program, in the training process. So <laughs> this, this is run, and then this is the mysterious part. By doing this, it comes to a series of complex probabilistic and statistical conclusions about the relationships between the noise and the words you might use, banana, fantasy, someone's name, mm -hmm. It comes to a very sophisticated oh, I see multi this image. This sounds good. Banana <laughs> Fantasy, what's it, his name? Great. Oh, I bet it's a great one. Um, it comes to a very sophisticated conclusion mm. about those things, a multi dimensional conclusion. And that conclusion, in heavy air quotes, is the latent space, mm. is what you will then interact with as an end user. So the latent space, and again, I would go check out the Vox explainer to see this it's with wonderful. graphics because. It's pretty hard to get just hearing someone say it, but yeah. if you if you imagine that a there's a line there's a line graph that has an x axis and a y axis, that it's easy for us to get. It's like you can it's position yourself indeed. And then if you have three dimensional knowledge, Here if you use go, three baby. programs, yeah. you can add z, right? Yeah. So you have x y z. Now you can position yourself three dimensionally. Now we don't know how to imagine this, but you can just keep adding axes. You know, yeah. you can go as much as you want. So the latent space has 
many axes. I actually don't know what the number is at the current state That's of the right. art. Yeah. It's, it's a high number of axes and it can, when you prompt it and you give it a seed number, it, well, triangulation is the wrong phrase because it's more than three axes. <laughs> yeah. There's many axes. And it finds or something. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> it finds a position within the latent space and mm. from that position, it produces the uh, generations that you're going to get. So a few interesting things that I want to um, say about this. One, once the model is trained and it has come to these conclusions in air quotes, they are conclusions. The model is done learning in heavy air quotes. Now I don't wanna make any false equivalences with human learning. I'm just using learning lightly. That's not, I'm not saying it's human learning. I think there's huge gaps between what this does and what human learning is. Oh, we yeah. can come back to that later, but so different. It, is, yeah. it is at that point done learning. So it is not going to change. It is a set static latent space that has a shape, a multi-dimensional shape. And this means certain interesting things, including what I just said, which is that if you put the same seed number mm -hmm. and the same prompt into the same model, if you change models, things are yeah, gonna change. Everything, but, yeah. But if in the same model, you use the same seed number and the same prompt, you will get the same generations over and over again because you are essentially going to the same X on this multi-dimensional map. Yeah, you're just going to the same the, location, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that these things are so intimately mathematically linked and it's so static, um, and because math can be run forwards and backwards, you could theoretically run the programs backwards. And if you had the final image and the seed number, you could produce the prompt that you would need to generate that image uh, from the other two aspects or reverse. You could use the image and the seed, you could use the image and the prompt to get the seed number sure. necessary. Mm -hmm. It's just that nobody runs the programs in those directions. Um, everybody runs it in the direction that we're familiar with, which is that prompt and seed number produce image. An image yeah. yeah. So, so in some sense, there's, and uh, you know, I understand that we may be arguing semantics here, but looked through the lens of the facts, in some sense it is art finding, you know, and generate, generation does capture that a bit, but um, the diction is important here, I think. You are navigating that latent space. Now, all of that is to say, that is why it is erroneous to look at it as at the point of prompting, it is scraping the internet for mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. It is looking through the latent space that has been conditioned by everything that has been scraped from the internet. Mm -hmm. Now, if that sounds like it brings up precarious legal gray areas, I would say that's guaranteed for sure. <laughs> I think that when this stuff when this stuff sees its day in court, it will be probably one of the most academic legal battles the world has seen mm -hmm. in a very very long time. This is going to it's kind of like it's a so Napster nuanced. thing or something, you know. Um, I think it blows Napster out of the water. Yes, and, I and, really and, do. And what I meant by that is like that's the first wink we've had at that kind of view of like when technology comes in. But like that was that was like prohibition almost in a sense it was like prohibition of data in the form of music this is this is uh if we're talking dimensional space thinking we're thinking of a sentient in a sense like it's we're talking this is a whole thing because <laughs> well, the, the multi-dimensional aspect of its of its calculation is something that we can't really perceive outside of like theoretical equations well then mm -hmm. we're really <laughs> I, I, no i i, I want to be careful I yes. want to be careful there. Yeah. It is certainly beyond our comprehension to a certain degree, yeah. but being beyond our comprehension does not mean it's sentient or that it's That's conscious. That's true. That's true. It, yeah. It, it can it be, <laughs> yeah, it can be, it can be as complicated as we could imagine. Yeah. But, but if it ends thinking or if it stops doing what it's doing, I guess, well, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But well, actually I think, I mean, if we're being very precise here, it's yeah, like, what, yeah, what is a sentient it, to you then? Like, I mean, there's a definition of yeah. it obviously, but. I, I personally go by the, the classic, um, the classic way of thinking about it. That's presented usually around the hard problem of consciousness. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure who, I want to say it was uh, a philosopher named Chalmers who maybe formulated this, but mm -hmm. basically for me, it's if there's something it is like to be a system, that means that it's conscious. And I personally believe sentience is predicated on consciousness. I don't, 
a, a sentience, that is to say, to be able to sense things, makes no sense to me nice. if, there is, <laughs> if there is no personal experience to sense it, right? So mm. we can... Um, Maybe it's beyond we, consciousness, though. Maybe it would go into a different realm. I don't know. That's an interesting. That's an interesting question indeed. No, that's that's deeper. No, that's definitely something I'd like to discuss while on certain substances. Yeah. No doubt. <laughs> yeah. Why aren't you down here in San Diego? Well, we take the truck and go out to the desert. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we could have that conversation for a long time. But yeah. okay. So, but no, to stay true. on track, yeah. I to me, and it's like a lot of people would say, like we're. I do think this stuff is relevant if we're trying to get precise because people do bring this up. I have seen in these discussions online, like there's a lot of people willing to say like, can't you see it's conscious? Like we must protect it or you can't delete it. And mm. I that's, per, that's don't, mirroring though. I think that's people mirroring potentially. I, I agree. Yeah. So, but I do think that's it's important to put out there why I think that that's just not right. I see no reason to believe that there's anything it is like to be stable diffusion. So it's not conscious. It is not sentient. And I just don't think that those arguments are actually relevant here. Mm -hmm. It can be doing as complicated a thing as we would like, but the brute fact of whether it's conscious or not doesn't change because we, so for me, for example, I believe ants are conscious, right? But they're compared to other animals, they're extremely simple, right? And they're running more simplified processes. I mean, in reality, they're actually already extremely complicated, yeah, but super complicated, for, but yeah, for me, I, I have no, it seems pretty, my guts tell me there's something it's like to be an ant, right? Can I prove it? No, but it seems right. Mm. I think there's certainly something it's like to be my dog. That, that sits right with me. Mm. And there's, unless somebody's going to make a solipsistic argument that they're the only conscious being in the universe, there's definitely something it's like to be me. There's something it's like mm. for the lights to be on here. There's a theory a of that too. I've heard of that too. Like the forget the name of that theory where people think that they're the center and then everything else is developed around them for their own experience. <laughs> I think it is. I think it is solipsism. I yeah. think that, that, that's, a, that's like that, you've not grown past the child maturity or something. Uh, Cause it, yeah. that, there, there's a barrier that you break through psychologically as a child when you realize that there's a world outside of yourself. Uh, Indeed. But anyways. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. That's good. It's good to identify these things because I also, I mean, I, I feel for people that have that kind of empathy for something that, they reach deep within themselves and they think of it. And I think a lot of that is just, it's like why our cars look like humans that they're just big heads right. driving around. It's like we put ourselves yeah. on everything because we know we were professionals of knowing ourselves. That's why the uncanny Valley is a, is the hardest mountain to climb in regards to yeah. like the art of CGI. It's like the thing that nobody can really overcome unless you're doing deep fake, which is like, that's my whole, my whole theory of is deep fake is going to solve the uncanny. But, um, mm -hmm. but that's, Again, I think it's doing what this thing is doing, which is pulling from existing worlds. Mm -hmm. And it's taking this existing world and kind of, what do you say? So it's like forming these equations in this, not in the latent space, right? Is the latent space the after product, right? That's what you get. It's, yeah, it is the, con I, I, ugh, I, there I'd have to defer to the actual machine learning experts because I'm I'm slow to make any definitive statement about what individual parts of the math are. Sure. But the the latent space is the conclusion, as far as I know, it, is the the result of the algorithmic process that they run on all of the data. Mm -hmm. And it is a probabilistic statistical mm -hmm. conclusion. And it's important to understand that it's probabilistic and statistical mm -hmm. because that explains why it has the problems that we see. Mm -hmm. For example, not understanding context, um, yeah. not, so, you know, it doesn't, for example, it will put one of the, one of the things that people and people share all sorts of interesting stuff, but you know, one of them is like, it'll put pictures of cooked salmon into rivers that are supposed to have live salmon in them. <laughs> and that is the stuff of dreams. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. It's a, <laughs> it's a mistake made because statistically it has just seen more photos of cooked salmon in the data set than live salmon. So it's just reacting hmm. to when you prompt it. It's hmm. not trying to give you, first off, it's not trying to give you anything, right? Because it's not sentient. It's not conscious. Yeah. It is, it is producing what is the best fit for the prompt, statistically speaking. It's hmm. not trying to produce the best art or anything like that. And those probabilistic problems produce embarrassments like that, these examples of not understanding context. It also produces more troubling things like 
that is what causes it to reproduce the biases that are present yeah. in the data set. Yeah. I saw someone post today that if you just ask Mid Journey for art, it just gives you a wall of Caucasian women. It's like this is what art is, and that's a that's a reproduction. In the box thing, something something about like nurse, and it was like all like Asian women or something like that it was like really like sexist and stuff and that's because it's yeah. pulling from the data set on the internet wasn't there a thing and you probably know this more and i'm solely connect, disconnected i think it was like google or somebody made a bot went online and within like a couple of minutes or hours it turned full racist and like they had to shut it down because <laughs> yeah, it's just I like there's it. a ton of garbage there's a ton yeah. of our like our trash on the internet of like oh wow like we need to evolve past this but it's yeah. why we're so it, fascinated with like World War II and murder shows and all this stuff. There's just like, and maybe you can get into the Freudian aspects of why we are so intrigued by these things. And he might have been onto something that was kind of interesting or Carl Jung or something. But yeah, <laughs> it's fascinating stuff. But it makes sense. But I get what you're saying earlier on, which is like, you're an optimist, but you don't think that we have the capacity in order for something to then take light and take flight. We don't really we should be cautious of it more than anything right now. And it, it, echoing what like Elon was saying uh, a while ago, that that's one of his biggest fears. And you have to know that a person that his power must be seeing things that the normal person's not seeing. So he's probably aware of it and going, Oh shit. Like we better be yeah. careful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, the way that this issue is usually formulated, as I understand it, the way that this issue is usually put in the machine learning world and especially in the parts of the machine learning world that are optimists that believe you could make something like a general intelligence, right? That perhaps is conscious. And if it's not actually conscious, sure passes the Turing test and everyone believes mm -hmm. is conscious. The way that this is usually formulated is uh, they call it the alignment problem. So the, if you believe you can do that, how do you make sure that the aims of this system are aligned with human aims, the alignment problem. Mm -hmm. um, I am very, I think that that's serious, you know, I, I and um, again, it's like, all right, well, you're just an artist talking about something on the internet, but no, I, want, I, would, further. <laughs> we have I would put forth that what we're going through right now is proof that the alignment problem is real yes. because yeah. We, we have this thing that we suddenly feel in relationship to. We feel like it came out of nowhere. And a big portion of people who feel they stand to suffer because of something about it are saying, this doesn't align with my humanistic values, which is placing a alignment problem question to the people who run the machines and to the systems in general. And they are receiving, well, we're, we're divided for sure, but the we're not honoring that request. And indeed, a lot of people, um, both not just the people who are controlling the systems, but also people who use the systems and you know just other people in general, um, are in fact being dismissive of the request to align the system with the values Why of a certain group is? of people. Why do you think people are being so dismissive? I, well, I think that this is a big enough question that it's probably, it's probably safe to say that people are being dismissive for a lot of reasons, for many different reasons. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're probably not sharing any one reason. Um, I really don't know. It's, it's I, when like a I, selfish aim or something, or there's an addiction to it, or. I'm not going to go out there and say selfish. I've definitely seen some stuff and heard of, you know, some things people have said to friends, for example, that when I read that, for that person, I'm like, damn, that's pure selfishness. It's just raw. They want to do the thing they want to do and they don't really care about anything else. But um, I, I, I would be slow to say that it's selfishness across the board. Uh, again, it's the technology is is a serious technology and it's it does what it claims to do, yeah. right? It, that's it, what makes it, it brilliant. That's why we're talking about yeah. it. It's, it's not like it's fake. It actually produces images that people want to put towards some end, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm not gonna say it's selfishness. I, I think there's plenty of people who wanna use it and wanna defend it because they see use cases, they see personal gain from it. They, they even on the more out there, what I consider to be out there positions, like this is a step towards utopia, 
I'm not going to say I don't believe that person means it. I think they probably mean it. I personally yeah. think that's misguided. I see a lot of problems with that, but I have no reason to believe that they don't believe what they're saying, you know? Mm. Um, so I don't think it's selfishness. I think it's a lot of different, I think it's a lot of different reasons. I think that if you, I think if you haven't been on the artistic journey for a long time, it can be, it's kind of asking a lot to ask people to give a shit. You know, I have to admit that, you know, um, yeah. as, as much as I love the journey that I've been on and as much as I love other artists and, you know, I make it my life to train other artists and, and meet them. And it's like, it's my favorite stuff in the world, but I'm under no illusions that most people get it or that it's easy to explain to people or that it's just, there's a lot of misconceptions about what the artistic journey is like and the reasons that people are on the artistic journey. So um, for people who are seeing this product as either a way to do something that they'd never seriously considered before or a way to return to um, an art practice that maybe they closed the door to early on in their life or something like that, yeah, I have to admit, I just, I just, I think it's always gonna be a little difficult to ask them to connect with like, how hard this has been and the humanistic demands of like, or the humanistic ass of like, can we take a breather here? Can we do this right? Like, I, I don't know. And, and, and it's just, it's, it's, it seems I'm amazed, but it seems hard to get people to understand. Like, yes, I know you saw my image on the internet, but that image is my labor. That's the work that I do. It is, it is the, it is the, the sweat of my brow. It is something that I've had to pour tons of effort into. And for a lot of us, it's, it is the, the, it is the labor, the only labor we could hope to monetize mm -hmm. for a lot of us, you know, it's like it, it's weird. It's like, um, just because it feels good, just because it, you know, art has a little bit of a magical quality doesn't mean that it's not labor. It's still work to make it. And it, it, it has the same protections that most other forms of labor do. Mm -hmm. But it's like for people who are coming at this fresh or are riding the wave in and, and have just heard about this stuff, it's like, what hope could we really have to, to get them to care about that? You know, I would hope yeah. they would, but no, but it's a not, they, don't, they wouldn't have a capacity for it. It's almost like, you know, so, something tragic's happening now. Right now, we don't know, and we're not present to it because we're not living that tragedy. You know, it yeah. just and that's happening. That's just that's the human condition, really, in a, in a nutshell, yep. um, and a lack of empathy. But a lot of times, I think people. I think if you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, most people are, are are wonderful people. Like. Yes. And you get down to the core of it, almost all, there's a, there's a great amount of us, better, more, because like, the, if not, then we would be living in a Mad Max world, and we, we don't. Um, but, yeah, I was thinking about the artist journey, and how it is almost unfair to ask of a stranger to empathize with that, and what that potentially is causing it. And and I think to get back to, I'm glad we you brought this up in the beginning of our conversation, is art has evolved you into a person you are today because you found it as a spiritual release and mm. to deprive somebody of that journey is almost depriving them of their identity. And that could be intrinsically big problem. <laughs> yeah. In regards to, I personally think so. Yeah. And, and same here. But then on the other side of the things, when you listen to like um, the developers that are building these things, they say, well, no, we're, we're, we're jumping past your journey. Not to say your journey is not important, but we're jumping past that and we're giving people that release. But I must say, and this is just my experience in life, is when you're given something with ease, it does not last. Yeah, It goes right through you and it doesn't sit with you. So what people are addicted to now and what they think is valuable now and this and that, it comes to my statement, which I'm curious what you think of it is, is if everyone's an artist, then no one is. Mm -hmm. And what do you think yeah. of that? Um, I think it's probably true. I think it's probably true to the, the question is to what extent, you know, I, I think, um, and, and I, you know, for anybody who hasn't seen my, my video, the end of art, an argument against image AIs, um, 
I, I presented basically my most dystopic view of, of what could come of it from that. Yeah. Um, I, I, my personal feeling is that it's inevitable that putting it out there into the zeitgeist and running news stories about it and, and telling the world over and over again, like, wow, art is made with a push of a button. Yeah, you just type in whatever you want. There's almost no way that doesn't devalue art as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, the, a, it makes it an abundance. Yeah. And scarcity yeah, it, is a part of art that makes it very special. Indeed. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an I, intrinsic part of the value system as we know it. But it's no matter what you and I say and what we want, the desire and consumption is far beyond our range. And yeah. we can be sitting here saying, hey, guys, please, everybody stop. <laughs> Uh, or, or take a moment. I don't think we're either of us are saying stop. I think we're saying take a moment, reflect on what this is actually really doing intrinsically yeah. outside of like, okay, yes, you're you're having people put in prompts and then this exchange happens and then there's this thing that's happened. But the the artist's journey is is if you're doing it right, it's akin to the the hero's journey, which is if you're doing it right, is akin to the human journey. <laughs> yes. And these yeah. are all connected to a very deep network of purpose and conscious support. Like it's, it's part of our consciousness, but it's a part of our yep. experience on, on earth. And maybe, uh, you know, I'm looking at this as a 39 year old. I'm like, I'm dating myself here, looking at life as it needs to be this thing that is potentially something I've been told what it is rather than, Hey, maybe this isn't what it is. You know, maybe life mm -hmm. isn't this thing. And it's important to have these kind of conversations. At least <laughs> I have them with myself. And I think that when you talk about art as a meditation, I say that when you're the drug and the drug dealer, it's very complicated, you know, because I'm the drug <laughs> and the drug dealer. I'm constantly feeding myself the drug. And yeah. um, but I don't know. I mean, and also another thing to say is it's almost like when you pass, it's almost like passing judgment when you've had a journey and you say you should take this journey too. It's you're, you're not allow, allowing people to have their own individual journey, and I'm not for that either. So. Yeah. At the end of the day, I'm always like, I'm like right on the knife's blade of, yeah, I hear you. And no, oh, no. And I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand completely. I mean, and, and some people, you know, who, who want me to be as gung ho about this as possible would, would not like this position. But, you know, I've, I've always, I've said it, I say it in the YouTube video that I make, that I made. Um, but truly, I do put the most importance on the experiential character of making art. It changed my life. I've seen it change students' lives. And when I say it's changed my life, I mean, it's it's as big a thing as you could ask for. Like it really radically transformed the character of my life. And it's, you know, people need existential buoys, you know? I mean, I, I know almost nobody who is happy to move through life without meaning, right? I know people who do, but they're not happy about it, right? Yeah. And an existential buoy is one of the greatest gifts life can give you. And mm -hmm. the, not said. just not just producing images, but making images, crafting images was my life raft in the chaotic sea of life. Mm -hmm. And I don't know would have done what I would have done without it. And it was certainly not about the end product. It was not about just the images that came out the other side. It was about the crafting. So that said, if the AIs were, if we took the pause and we did it all ethically, right? As, as I've posited before, and as I say in that video, um, I see no reason if it's done right to then interrupt that, right? If it's all consenting parties, if it's groups of artists who are coming together and they're feeding their own data sets into the system and they're using it for reasons that they want and it's not infringing on anybody and it's not stepping on anybody, yeah. I, I see no reason to keep people from doing that. And the code and everything that that's been doing and the secret sauce is fully open source and fully exposed and not being used as a money machine, basically. That's probably, yeah, that's how it has to really be if it's to be that thing. But then why would somebody ever devote their lives as programmers and, and, and business owners to give their stuff away? I would imagine too, that's gotta be a conundrum for them <laughs> well i don't know i mean you get into some of these arguments a lot of people are claiming they're doing it for the most utopian you know free ideals so if they mean that then they should still do it even in those circumstances but yeah but but what i want to say is that but me personally even if that all goes through i'm not interested in using them 
Not right now. Like I'm not, that's not why I do art. And yeah. that's not what I, I care about this. As far as I know, I'm not in the data sets, right? Like now you can't search them all, yeah. Yeah. right? You, you can search lion five B to some extent on have I been trained.com mm -hmm. and I've looked, but I've never found any of my stuff on there. And I, I may be in the other data sets, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you can't search all of them. You've been but blacklisted. I you're they they're like no we can't we can't no mess Stephen with him. <laughs> don't don't let Stephen be up on the witness stand at any point yeah um, <laughs> he's way too knowledgeable of our <laughs> our system <laughs> so um so I I'm not in there I'm I'm my concerns about it are less personal more truly humanistic and also for the the pain that I'm seeing people go through about it and for my the love of art that I have as I've explained mm -hmm. so I. If it was all fixed, I'm, I don't see why I would use it. You know, it's like it's not it's not for me. I'm looking for different things mm, out enough. of art. Mm. But um, but if it was all done right, I wouldn't I would tell people my opinion. I'd be like, I think that it hurts this part of the process and it closes the door to this spiritual experience or something like that. Yeah. And then as soon as I've said it, people can take it or leave it. Mm. That's how art is like mm. people can come join me over there and I would never get in the way of the consenting adult artists who are doing it on their own and it's all above board and it's not hurting anyone. It's like, let them do their thing. Yeah. Of course, I see no reason to step on that. Do I think that, do I personally think from my viewpoint, that's the smartest move for an artist? Not personally, but yeah. they have to go on their journey. They've got to go yeah. through their thing. Yeah, we all must take that journey, which is really at the end of the day, that's it, you know, and everybody has their own journey and uh, your journey is completely different from mine as it should be by the design of life and the design of consciousness and the, and the design of existence, which, yeah. which I think that, you know, when this is the thing that I would just really blow my fucking mind. And this all happened. I was like, all right, let me get this straight. The big move that this thing is doing is it's, it's attacking like the core. <laughs> Cause we always thought, you know, the, it, the artist is the artist. You can't do that. You know? And, and, and I yeah. think that's, that's again, the, that's how we're getting caught with our pants down <laughs> yeah, yeah and it's we're literally getting exposed to the facts that all of our core beliefs of what this thing would be is like oh yeah it'll you know it'll take care of amazon and it'll do these things and it'll like we'll have flying cars and blah 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 well we don't have any of those but now it's attacking nope. the artist uh community <laughs> it's like yeah wait hold on guys <laughs> hold on cool. for a second here um like let's take it easy but maybe that's yep. actually if we think about spiritually, that's actually what needs to happen. It needs to, and people need to go, am I human and what am I doing? And the podcast that, that I had done about AI, just the focus one is I said, creating a picture, pretty picture is no longer the goal anymore. And, mm -hmm. and in my opinion, to a certain point of your artist journey, your goal is to make a pretty picture. Once you get past it, you got to ask yourself, why am I making this pretty picture? It's that experience yeah. you had where you're like, oh shit, if I'm not this, who am I? Because a lot of us, we just fall down. We just, we're like the, you know, the firefly at night, you know, the light. And we're all just looking at a thing. You saw it in Star Wars. I saw it in Star Wars. I grew up and I saw Star Wars and Jurassic Park. And I was like, ah, shit, how do I become part of this? I want to make magic yeah. with these people, you know? And then I went on this quest and it's been <laughs> extremely painful. <laughs> but it's been a journey nonetheless. And, yeah. and it's provided a life of existence for myself and my loved ones, which is amazing not by just accident it's by design but yeah i don't know it, it it's uh i think that's what makes it so interesting to talk about one of the things you mentioned earlier is people that don't have this understanding of this art world i'll shed some light into it i deal with a lot of people in the fine art space now because of nfts mm -hmm. i do a lot of studio visits with people that are traditional art professionals and collectors and they work in that space which is a I don't want to be mean or rude, but it's a closed circuit of gatekeepers. It's, it's, a, right. it's, a, it's a human social system of gatekeepers and they let in value and they close out value. And it's this, it's this thing. It's like a closed market kind of thing. And it's really interesting. And that, and I could be completely wrong. It's just my analysis of dealing with it for the past couple of years. Now, when I bring these people into my digital studio and, and mind you, I come from a traditional standpoint. I, I, I know how to paint oils. I was, I'm traditionally taught in all the old mediums of the old world, you know, which mm -hmm. I still love, but I don't do them anymore. But oils, acrylics, pastel, you know, gouache, all of the things. 
when I explain to them what it is to be a, a digital 3D artist, they're really, they, it's hard for them to comprehend, even when yeah. I'm showing them in real time, because it doesn't make sense, because I'm relying on technology. You know, as a digital artist, I'm relying on Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, coders, programmers, all these things, uh, Adobe, and they're all feeding off of me, but it's like this, you know, this thing. But I find it really fascinating. It's so interesting I, it's because I get yeah. so caught in my own little bubble and I think, yeah, everybody knows why this, but they don't. They just think that we're pushing yeah. a button and then something happens and then all of a sudden reality happens and it's like, it's so complicated. People don't know right. what render farms are and all these kind of things. And hopefully they're going to be a thing that, you know, just be like, oh, I can't remember. I can't remember, remember farms. But anyways, when I, when you mentioned that touched on that, I realized, oh shit, that's somebody in the art space. They don't even understand or can't yeah. comprehend the, you know, how digital art is really made. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's fascinating. It's <laughs> it, wor it worries me because yeah. it, it really is like you said, and you see this with students all the time when they're trying to, they're getting into this world and they don't know how to explain it to family or something like that. Yeah. It's what you said. It's, even though, even if you're using one of these, a digital stylus, and you're in Photoshop doing brushstrokes, like leave photos out of it. Even if you're like hand painting stuff in Photoshop, people just have no context for yeah. that. They they already thought we were kind of just pushing a button yeah. or they weren't even thinking about it. They were just sort of tacitly assuming something like that. And unless you, you know, uh, unless you work right next to them and they see you sitting there sweating for eight hours a day, yeah. they might never understand it. So imagine the damage it's going to do to the art community when those same people hear on the news actually art is made by pressing a button yeah. and really good art uh, art so good that it worries professional artists and things like that it's like mm. the optics on that are abysmal <laughs> really really <laughs> abysmal it's going to be hard to come back from yeah well and also when we talk about like again our spiritual journey individually and what art has given us when you remove that from the human experience, I think you're going to cause a big damage um, potentially. And, and, and I'm also for the utopian side, which I love. I say, you know, bring on the utopia. I'm all for it. I would love to it, but I don't think that's, I think it's extremely naive and I don't think that's necessarily like a viable thought to have, but I also yeah. <laughs> love the romantic quality of thinking that way. But yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, just the, just you saying that it just got my head going, Pfft. Like, uh, <laughs> it's like shit, you know. It's it, it, it's it's a bummer. Like, I, I, it, it's a real it, bummer. All you can do is laugh because it, it's so tragic, you know. It's so absurd. Think, yeah, <laughs> absurd is the word. But yeah, um, yeah. I think if if you're a, a younger artist or an artist or everybody across the board at whatever part of your journey and you're seeing this, this is hitting you so hard. Yeah, I mean, it's. I feel for you, and I feel like if there's ever been a time for you to find your authentic self, it's more so now than ever because you have no other value to the world other than discovering who you are. And I don't know what you agree with that, but I think if you can discover who you are and what value you can bring, like look at what you've managed to do. Like you found, you went through this whole journey, you went through this and that, and now you're doing YouTube videos and like you're finding that this, this avenue of you being authentic and curious has led you to find other people and then you've masked this kind of, viable way of experiencing life and navigating it. And who knows what it's going to be in five years. I can tell you both, both you and I are going to have a completely different perspective yeah, one way or the other about what's going to happen. But, um, yeah, it's, it's so fucked. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I, so first it, it, just as a reaction to like, you know, there and, and what, what I, I don't know what, what I might think going forward. Um, I, I personally, as I've learned more and educated myself about these things and looked into legal questions and ask people questions about things like that, I personally have only been made more optimistic about what is going on. Uh, and, and the optimism I was talking about before, um, I, I just think that we can negotiate some sort of fix, some sort of break, some sort of mitigating factor. Um, I, I am not, a lot of people feel very completely hopeless about doing anything to stop this. And mm. I, I would say that I maybe started there and I've 
come around to the other side, uh, the more that I've learned. I think, um, especially if we, if we open the scope out from the art stuff, mm -hmm. I think even if we really struggle on the artistic part of it, very soon with things like deep fakes and this getting into mm -hmm. um, just affecting normal everyday people and what sorts of images can be made of them non-consensually, oh, this whole data acquisition and data use problem is going to have a lot of energy behind it from every sector, not just art. I think everybody is going to get involved with this. Yeah. And I personally, as I said, I'm pessimistic that the governments of our world right now would give us a utopia, but I'm actually not completely pessimistic that they would not respond to very realistic concerns that their constituents have about these companies basically having carte blanche to do whatever they want with all of their data for the rest of the time. I just can't imagine a judge or a congressperson or anyone just realizing that that is the precedent that is being set and just being okay with allowing mm -hmm. that precedent. I think that there's going to be a lot of energy around these conversations. And I think people are going to take them very seriously. The sort of, um, the sort of like hands up in the air, like no one's gonna help us. Governments are completely against us on this. Um, that attitude, I have to say, I don't share that attitude. Good for you. And um, it, I do, not a place I admit to be, that, you know, I mean. It feels good, <laughs> for sure. It feels good. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. not crazy enough to not admit that once things show up in court, life is chaos, right? It's like we've all seen court cases go in ways that we we would have thought there was no way they could go that way. So yeah. when push comes to shove, uh, it's going to be a nail biter. Like I'm going to be on the edge of my seat <laughs> like anybody else. But um, my, my, my main push right now is like, let's let it have its day. Let's let's really have these conversations. Let's get it into court where it needs to get into court. Let's legislate it or try to legislate it wherever it can be legislated. And let's um, let's work this out. You know, let's do the pushes and let's do the pushback and let's have for the love of God. It's like this conversation is already so nuanced, so complicated, and it's mostly just us, like little old us having the conversation. We're not machine learning experts and we're not lawyers, right? And yeah. I think it's going to be very interesting and I, that's what I want. I almost want it to move off of us mm -hmm. and let's see when the lawyers and the actual machine learning professionals meet. Let's see what happens and see what the academic debate actually is. That's what I'm looking forward to right now. Mm. I'm also concerned about like that there's been so much money exchanged in this, this cycle that there could be so much money backing it because didn't one of them just get funded for like 20 bill or something like that? Open AI think, or uh, something like that. I'm not sure about Open AI's recent funding, but I know Stability AI. Stability AI. Uh, just for yeah, they just received a one billion dollar valuation, and I believe that their most recent funding round uh, gave them about a hundred million in capital. But their but their valuation is at one billion right now. It okay. might have changed since that news broke, but. Yeah. I mean, the only reason I say that is because our system in America, whether you believe it or agree with it or not, is completely move, money moved. So it's like if there's enough money yeah. pushing this, it's going to push legislation and there's going to be all these problems. And we're going to have this big take disconnection from human and soul here. And it's a big problem. So but I do love that we're having these conversations. You know, I got to meet you through what you were saying, in your words, and we're having this conversation. And I hope it's somewhat revealing, you know, That's great. And we're going to see what lasts from art from after this. But I mean, you kind of touched on it a little bit, which is like artists opting into letting their art be used. And that's great. And then having some sort of like system in line where things are actually going through a, a machine that's actually ethical along with the alignment of the human goal. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is there anything else like that you can think of that would be good to have like an intrinsic tool you know, if like, if let's say like you had a moment to talk to a lawyer that was facing this case and you were like, I'm an artist, this is what I value. I would give, I would, I would suggest that you look into this or bring this to the case, or this is why I think this is valuable or whatever it might be. Do you know what those would be? Um, yeah, I think, um, because I'm worried about not just the, the text to image models, but what, what could happen to music if this comes to music? Yeah. What is coming to voice performers who are sort of having um, 
voice performance models made of their of their uh, their voices and the way that they act, uh, which is directly threatening uh, their livelihoods, uh, and really everyone. You know, the I mean, all the way down to you know truck drivers having self driving trucks um, take their jobs. Um, my questions are really foundational, you know, and unfortunately, probably not all that practical for someone like a lawyer. I mean, for a lawyer, I think I have put out there the things that I that I really practically think, you know, I, I it should all be um, consensual and uh, either public domain or Creative Commons work. Even Creative Commons work has licensure requirements. A lot of stuff that's Creative Commons still demands that you give them credit and that you uh, re- you also transfer the license, like wherever you're going to use it, you show the, the Creative Commons license and that it needs to be recredited every time that this thing gets shared. All of those things should be respected by the models. Um, there, there might be some use to um, making the models able to pay royalties to individual artists who are used. So instead of just, you know, I think Greg Rakowski has been prompted, his name has been used to prompt hundreds of thousands of times at this point. Uh, if, if he got even half a dollar for every one of those prompts, um, that would be that would be very helpful. Um, but the question there is how much damage is it doing to his career in perpetuity? You know, the even the light, even the royalty payment questions are pretty hairy in my personal opinion, because um, it's it can become a perfect copycat for all of time, for all of perpetuity. So you've got to ask for a lot of money to make it worth it, to let this thing sort of go out into the wild, Mm -hmm. able to do the work that you do. That really worries me. Um, Again, I I think so much of this is just like, if we could just get our heads on straight and just say clearly in the law, you're not allowed to form money for whatever reasons you want, use everything that everyone alive has ever made for whatever end you want, which I think is the most, <laughs> what? The most sensical option here. Yeah. If we could just get that in the law that you're not allowed to do that, yeah. I think that that would basically cover a lot of the problems. I think that companies would be very slow to sort of launch on these kinds of uh, axiomatic assumptions about what they're allowed to do yeah. with people's data. And if they were going to launch, they'd probably launch with more intent to pay people for their data or to give them royalties or something like that. Um, and I think that's just super sane because the precedents will apply everywhere. Like I said, for music, every kind of performance for, and the people are generating data in this era. Still post- Sorry. Ash, come and Ash. But All right, you you froze yes. you froze out there. The damn bots are they they know we're being independent thinkers right now. They do not. They like know it. they <laughs> they can hear it over the Wi-Fi. Um, is it okay to keep going? Or yes, please, please, a, please. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. you're talking about just keeping the 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 language clear and allowing people not to just go full God mode. On, yeah. on on civilization and monetize. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because you imagine absolutely. going through a game and being paid to go full God mode. <laughs> Just come on, man. <laughs> it feels like <laughs> it's just crazy. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. And it's because yeah. we. And, and I think why it's so complicated. It's it's the same thing with the global warming. Like, I think that we're we're so small in perceiving what reality is because we live at such a finite current. Like, if we look at time as a scale of of existence, our ex- you and I, our lives are just not, not even a thing. It's not even. Yeah. It's almost not even worth calculating how small it is and the scale of what time is as we know it perceptually by the theories of what time and where time came in the big bang and whether you stand on the religious side or whatever doesn't matter it's, it's still the same kind of thing it's very small and i think the same thing with the global warming thing i think the same thing with this too is like we don't have a perception of 
it's so complicated. Even you getting into it, you don't realize how dynamic this space in which it's calculating this noise <laughs> formula. Yeah. And in you've been dedicating a lot of hours and time to this, you know, and I think that's probably one of the big things too for the person that doesn't have the convenience to spend their time doing this. They're just busy trying to feed themselves. They yeah. don't care and, and nor should they, you know, that, but yeah. and I think that's also adding to it. And I think it's just, it's making for people to go like, well, if you're dumb, I'm going to take advantage of you. And then well, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we are. Yeah. So I, I really hope we can get, we can all get clear on that. We can clean up those precedents. Um, and I, on the, but, but beyond the very practical level I do. And I allude to this in, in a few points in, in the video that I made, it's like, like you said before, we've got to have a, 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 like a spiritual check-in. Like we really need to ask ourselves, I do think as, as a totality, uh, as a race of people, who do we think this is all for? Because if this is going to keep coming up, this is going to come up over and over and over again. And it's like, do we all agree that good things in life, that the quality of existence is for human beings to enjoy and that we should, we should prioritize that while we're perhaps in the lucky period of time where there is no counterfactual. There is, there is, there, there is, we haven't accidentally made a conscious machine that can make claims to rights and suffering and things like that. What, what, if something like that happens, we need to have possibly, probably the most terrifying conversation uh, that will, will ever occur in the lifetime of a civilization. Um, but until then, we're in the very lucky position where we can all kind of look at each other and nod and be like, this is for us, right? Like we, we shouldn't give away the stuff we like doing for no goddamn reason to, to machines that are not going to experience the joy of the labor and things like that. And that, mm. that question mm. I think applies to everyone who is threatened to be automated away. To me, mm. it seems very clear. And it's, it's like, some people would say that that's anti-progress and it's like, I actually see that as progressive. If, if, if we're prioritizing mm. the joy of human beings and the ability of human beings to provide for themselves and to be proud of their lives and to look for existential buoys in life that make them feel good. Mm. It's like that, that looks like progress to me because I, I, it seems the more people I meet, the more I find people are suffering with that and they have difficulty finding a life that has meaning and a pursuit that has meaning and, and feeling like they have a place in the world. So mm. that that's the big question that I want us to reckon with because I'm surprised to find that people are dubious and, and, and I'm truly shocked to see, and I, they might be trolls, but I am shocked to see how many people don't agree and think that the machines that have no, no consciousness behind them have some sort of stake here. It's like, they act like it would be an awful crime to delete stable diffusion. I'm going to go out on a, I'm like going to Stockholm plant my syndrome issue, a mental issue. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm comfortable to sit here and put a flag in the sand that says it would not be an awful crime to delete stable diffusion. I, I, obviously I know it can't just be deleted, but you know what I mean? To sure. use a term of phrase. Yeah, removed from use. Yeah. Yeah. It really would not be mm. that awful of a loss. And I understand that there's many, noble use cases that we can imagine and that people are exercising right now but a noble end use case does not justify the unethical way that this thing was built from the ground up it just doesn't justify it i mean we we can apply that to every other you know every aspect of life yeah everything someone a student could walk into my studio one day and be like hey it turns out that the only form of self-expression that gives me joy is that i need to shoot people with a gun that's my art that's my performance art and i could tell them no you, you you're not entitled to that particular form of expression just because it would produce great expressive joy inside of you there's problems with how that hurts people yeah surprisingly there's some new york city performance art where you know at least people let themselves get shot with a gun and that was pretty famous art but you know it's it's sure. pretty hairy what's possible with art pretty hairy what's possible with well art. Like, as you said it's all subjective there's no end and then we talked about it. there's no master to it and if we're when you yeah. and i are, are classically trained in a sense so we come from this world that we think uh oh, blah 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 and we have all these 
things on our shoulders that of the past that people say what art is. And so it's really hard to kind of bend through it and navigate through it. And, and, mm-hmm. and it's also really hard to understand it, if you actually are making the art that you should be making or whether you're just being hypnotized, as you said, you know, and you know, and that's another thing to have a conversation with yourself about, which is totally fucked. I really think it's beautiful. Totally and I love, yeah, the totally fucked is basically, <laughs> that's what this episode's called. <laughs> but I love your take on, which I agree. And I, this was, I told you when we were talking before we did the podcast is I really wanted to talk about the spiritual humanistic aspects of it. Cause I feel like it's easy to get caught in the, the nitty gritty, um, stuff, which is very important too. Um, mm-hmm. but I think that, like you said, it's like, we got to ask ourselves what we're doing this for. And, and I think it's very nearsighted when people are like, they're like, they're attacking it or trying to support it. And I get why they would want to do that. I would, I would think that they, it's a drug and, and they're high on a drug. It's a dopamine jump. You're like, Oh, look, I yeah. press the button. And, and, and instead of taking a whole lifetime of, of experience to do this thing, it's just coming back at me. And it's like, yeah. well, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm an artist. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, and, 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 and I, I think also this is one thing I've always had a point of contention with the art world in general is that when you ask the common person what art is, they'll say, Oh, a Van Gogh or this and that. It's like, sure. Yes. Because they've been, champion through the time you know but in his time and in that person's experience as an art artist there's been countless masters that have gone through time in and out life and death and not seen the light of day and i think it's it's a tragedy you know and i think that this is also exposing the fact that with an abundant of repetition of the past of people think that there's just this weird thing that's happening where there's this almost like this spiritual dissonance that's happening. One thing I noticed that I thought was really interesting is I, you know, when I was first doing this, I was like, this is fascinating. This is wild. I can't believe this is happening. And, and then I would, I would share it with friends. And then like, I'd had friends, some friends like, Oh, how did you make that image? Like, I'm not telling you. Cause I want to see what you make. And mm-hmm. what I realized quickly is that you, 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 it doesn't just make pretty images. You have to have instincts of taste and composition, and all these kind of things. So it does mm-hmm. take that to evolve it, which I thought was fascinating. And I, I'm really wondering and curious to see what's going to happen from it. You know, from the devil's advocate side of things, like if, if, if you and I and everybody in this world don't have to do this thing called job working currency and all these things, these friction points in life, if we don't mm-hmm. have to do that, then what's left of it is life an experience of just pleasure but what's pleasure without discomfort, you know? And then we get into yeah. this. What is that? What is existence without meaning? You know, what's existence? Yeah. And, and, and is there a, an existence without meaning? And again, these are all like bigger conversations to be had and thought of. And that's what I said. Like, I feel like the, the human soul is what an artist is. And I think the human soul is connected to your, who you are is from the fail you, failures you've overcome. It's like, look at your, your dad passed away. That was a big, hard adversity thing that you're still dealing with. But I think that potentially some of the fuel in which the time you're putting into this is showing the world that this is important to me because it got me through this thing. And I don't want you to forget this. And I need you all to remember this. And there's a mechanism there, um, that shouldn't be like stepped over, but I don't think so. No, I, I don't. I mean, I think that people, anyone who's been on this road with us, I think the vast majority of them would agree. I mean, Mm. most of the things in my life that really give me the most robust joy and that I feel proud of and pride almost isn't quite the word. It's like, it's a much deeper, just um, an existential happiness that I get to do that and that it worked out. It's like, they're all born from discomfort. They were all born from working things out and going through difficult periods with them and their their current pleasurable state is inextricably linked with the discomfort that they came from for mm. sure and i just don't i can't fathom what a version of those things without the discomfiture base would look like or why i would care about it it just doesn't mm. it doesn't land you know it really doesn't land well i actually to add to that and i've noticed this from other artists that i've seen that that have interacted with this technology and i've interacted with it and the first time i used it i was like oh i'm not sleeping this is crazy and i was yeah. generating thousands of images and i was like and i re- i instantly knew i was like well this isn't my art this is some weird thing and i'm like and i didn't show it i didn't really talk about it to anybody publicly i mm-hmm. shared it amongst my friends I'm like this is crazy can't believe this is happening and this is what happened with me and my experience with it and i could be completely different or unique or whatever but 
I went through the process. I took the drug. I got super high on the drug and then it, it went <laughs> and then it kind of exploded. And I was like, that was really cool, weird. And, um, I'm just going to go back to doing art the way I like to do yeah. it. And I just yeah. was like, cool. And, and I, and, and another thing that's happening too, and I have a couple friends that are full on, full embracing it, love it. And I love that they love it because they're training their own like stable diffusion or whatever on their own machines yeah. at home. And they're, and they're really getting into it. And I'm like, I really think that's fascinating because they're really kind of seeing this thing going, Oh, it's maybe it's something I could use here. And, and when they're doing that, all I'm doing is going, I'm putting more of me in my art, <laughs> you know, yeah. because I'm realizing the currency of the day and then the future is me just being who I am exposing to the world that I am this person. Um, and whether that turns out to be something of value to others or not, that's the thing, you know? So, and there's an argument to be had for both sides. You know, people are saying this is going to remove jobs. Well, maybe those jobs, maybe from what they say, it shouldn't exist in the first place, or maybe they should. And maybe you shouldn't take that away from somebody or let them have that decision. Um, again, I see how it, this thing works. It's like you open one door and then three more questions happen. You have to go through another door yeah. and it's like you're in a labyrinth of thought, really. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. I know I was, I was trying to lead us into this, you know, while we kind of close this conversation, I was trying to lead us into a, a form of like, cause I know that, you know, I, there's enough uh, doom and gloom out there and, and, and I totally understand it. And it's a part of the equation too, which I think is important. And, um, but I always like to, to think there's, there's two things I would like to try and navigate us towards at the end is, mm-hmm. and the one question I like to ask everybody now, uh, uh, cause I, I stopped the podcast for a long time. I brought it back and one of the things is is I like, I like to ask you like, what are you currently like blessed to have in your life? What, what, what's something that you're really thankful for? Mm -hmm. Man, uh, this may sound like I'm dodging the question a bit, but I want to be clear that I, I I don't mean to, but it's like, um, uh, it'd be hard to pick one thing, you know? I mean, my, I feel very, very fortunate to be in the position that I am, that I'm in. Um, Even through these times with AI and how tumultuous things feel, um, I spend most of my time just feeling great, you know, just feeling very, very lucky that I get to make work and that I have the time to make my artwork and that I have put things in a position where I don't have a lot of really influential outside influences on my work. Like no one making strong demands, no one like nothing, no, like my audience isn't expecting a particular thing from me or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And that I have made my practice such that I can put a lot of me into it, you know? So when I feel like writing, I can write. When I want to be more serious, I can do that. When I can, when I want to be more of a goofball, I can do that. Like I, I have a very wide open space and the fact that that is like a, that I've pre- made that context for that and that that's my life and that I get to have like my dog and my wife in there. And just the, the fact that it's sort of become commonplace now, like there's a beautiful mm-hmm. commonplace nature to this totally weird thing that I do. Um, my, I like that it's become commonplace. I like that it's just normalized now, but I try to spend as much of my time, and this goes back to the, the my meditation uh, experiences and just that that practice that I've had in my life as well. It's like, I try to just, and I'm not gonna say I'm good at it, but I try to spend as much of that time as I can just really appreciating moment to moment uh, the good luck that I have and how nice my little world is um, a, a lot of these, a lot of the time I, um, I feel like I'm noticing that I feel better more of the time than I have before. Mm. And it's like, I, it's beautiful. That's enough. That's like candy, you know, like it really is enough for me to just like take a moment to sit on the couch and be like, shit, mm. I, I, oh my God, I'm, I'm a person with a life where I feel good most of the time what are the odds? That's fucking impossible. Like how, how did that happen? That's like yeah, such most people amazing... sit on the couch and just zone out. You're getting, getting deep with yourself and thinking on it. 
I, if yeah. you if you put your mind on that stuff just with some regularity, it, it, you kind of build a little a little interior ritual space for it, yeah. and it's like that little that little internal altar gets more embroidered as the years go on. And um, again, I know it may sound like I'm dodging the question, but it's I like I think so. I mean, it, it's an open question. To I mean, you just said that you're blessed to have the life you have, which I think is it's the ultimate goal, you know, and it's a, it's awesome to hear that just getting to know you. I think that's wonderful. I'm so happy for you. Cause that's like kind of this, the chief aim and goal of life is to have that balance and to have a life that you're just thankful for united basically, yeah. which is wonderful. Last yeah. thing I would like to ask it would actually sure. two, two questions. Um, for those who are out there that are in this space, we kind of touched on it a little bit too. We're trying to help in a sense where we're creating a conversation between us and, you know, maybe to counter this, we should have somebody that's super pro for it and hear what they have to say as well, just to kind of keep the things moving. But, um, for those that are out there and they're kind of, and you deal with students and, and people on the different parts of their journey and their, their art and stuff, what's one piece of advice you think that you could potentially give them that was a, like a nugget for you that helped you evolve or mature in a positive way? The pressure. Yeah, it's always hard to bring it down to one thing. Yeah, um, it could be whatever. You can open it up if you have a couple things. You're oh, this I know this helped and so so forth. I think the the biggest one, and it's also the hardest one, is you need to learn how to trust yourself. Mm. And if you if you as an artist and as a student have not put some thought and time and effort into that one yet, I would recommend beginning running that process as early as possible. Um, it's one of the most common problems that comes up in the artistic journey. Just doubt multiplies so easily. It's like, you can just make up doubts about whatever you want. You know, they're free, they come free. Yeah. But feelings of like confidence and that you trust yourself and that you feel good about your guts on something, those are becoming surprisingly hard to come by uh, in our in our current culture. It seems, um, it's. If, I really do think that if you could just tweak that just right, everything else kind of follows on its own. Like, if you can really learn how to trust yourself, and that includes trusting yourself through times of confusion. Right. It doesn't mean like you always have an answer for everything, but like there's a form of trusting yourself where you're just like, you can trust that this time of confusion is warranted and that it's okay to not know. And you don't know the answer and you're just going to keep going and everything's going to be fine. If you can keep doing that throughout your life and through your career, it's going to be hard to sort of beat you around. You know, you're not going to get distracted by stuff about like, what style you should be doing or what jobs you should be taking or what what you should feel about your life or your career or things like that if yeah, you can that's really the outside learn, world pushing in yeah yeah mm -hmm. if you can learn how to trust from within mm -hmm. that's going to protect you from a lot of the bad incentives and the bad assumptions mm -hmm. that are uh, associated with all those questions and i think that it's going to make it a little easier to get to an intimate connection with your your inner voice and what you really want to help you get there faster. Mm. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think that I did my biggest steps and movements in my own career in art when I really just doubled down on myself. And yeah. I didn't realize it was trust. I guess I should have thought of it as trust, but I... Yeah, I guess it is. It's it's a thin line though because you can you can become an egomaniac if you trust and you fall into the trust too far and then you don't let yourself kind of expose yourself to the outside world too. It is such a it's such a cocktail of of things. <laughs> but I, I agree. I think that's wonderful and that's wonderful advice for everybody. And, and, and to dig into that just a little bit more when it comes to mm -hmm. trust, let's say you have you seen a crossroads where you've seen a lot of creatives hit and then they need, they go left when you suggest they go to the right for trust. Uh, what would it be that crossroads? And, and how do you see like, you know, like, let's say like somebody like, a, this is a common artist mistaken problem I find is they ask their spouse or loved ones or somebody that's not intrinsically connected to the creative spirit or whatever. 
they ask them what they think of what they're doing and then they just get crushed by it. <laughs> yeah. Which is, yeah. it's happened to us all. That's a common thing, but I don't know what comes, comes to your mind. Um, I, the thing that comes to my mind is, is a pretty almost subtle, but pernicious thing that comes up for a lot of artists, which is, um, so many artists will go down a path for years. A lot of the time where, they're doing something they don't fucking like mm. because they think there's all these other good reasons to do it. Mm. So uh, it, it, it may be a bit broad, but it's that one gets almost everybody at yeah. at least some point. They, mm. they, they sort of maybe get used to the fun or the joy that's around with art mm -hmm. and they can sort of not honor it a little bit or not pay enough attention to it. And then these other things come up like feeling you need to get in with a certain industry or niche or group of people or make a certain amount of money. That's Social another one. Like a microphone to it as well. And it, and it, and it, and it, um, it adds quantifiable data to it saying, well, that got one trillion likes and this one didn't. Nope. And, oh, I don't, I want likes, you know? <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah, which makes it even, it turns it, it I think that's been a real big problem for a lot of art in general. <laughs> and yeah, artists, it's artists' minds too. Yeah, unfortunately. Dude, it's, it's everywhere. So what the, the way that that, the, the way that that dovetails with the trust stuff is that like you, you've got to trust that the things that you like, you like them for a good reason even if you're not sure about it. Like artists are really quick to turn away from like, a lot of the times their most intimate joys about art because they make weird assumptions. They're like, oh yeah, that's just something I like. Mm -hmm. But it's like art is about what other people like. And then they'll turn away from what got them interested in drawing or painting or whatever for 20 years. Yeah. And then they, they look back and they're like, wait, why did I not pay attention to that thing? And then they come back to it later. And it's like, mm -hmm. as a journey, that's fine. If they seem weird to you or that, or you worry that other people wouldn't like it or that it wouldn't make you money, you've got to trust that that's there for a reason and that it actually makes sense that sort of the thing you would be known for as an artist would be something unique and intimate and something that other people might find unexpected mm. or something like that. Um, so I'd say that's the big one from my estimation, just oh, not, yeah. not trusting that feeling of interest and joy in an aspect of your work and following that down a bad road, that other juncture where you, you look around five years later and you're like, Oh my God, I, I don't like doing this. How did this happen? Why, why am I expending all of this creative energy mm -hmm. to do something that I don't like and that I don't agree with? It happens to people all the time. Yeah. yeah that's the big one for me. It's like the talking head song, you know, uh, where is this beautiful life or this beautiful house? You know, it's like all these things. It's, 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 um, I think that's oh. when you let the outside world. Hello. Oh, Ash. can you hear me cutting my robotic? You'll be back any second now. I'm sure I'm just going to sit here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Can you see? Oh, me? you froze again. Sorry. Did you hear the end of my answer or no? Yes, I did. Thank you. Blessed, blessed the technology. <laughs> Your voice came through, but you locked in on the it's, really cool pose, which is great. You look like an action figure that was talking. Oh, that's through. good. <laughs> but nice. no, I was just saying. All right, but I, but I, I you agree. still got the audio. But yeah, you yeah. still got the audio, right? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Cool. And for those of you listening, sorry, the internet for some reason between us, we're on. I don't know. It's just acting up, and that's just kind of how it goes. We all know this because this is the state of technology at this time. So, um, yep. but trusting yourself is wonderful. Fully back that, and I love that concept, and I think it's such a an important thing, and it's also good to identify that, and hopefully. If you're listening, you're having a hard time trusting yourself. I always say that this this is an ecosystem of the the human experience, and I think art is the thing that, you know, I was born as a Caucasian male in America, but my art is something completely different, and that is the goal with my art. It's supposed to be something different. It's it's all of these weird, intrinsic things that make me really who I am. Yeah. So when you look at me on the outside, you say, oh, this is this person, but that's just an assumption. My art is actually my soul. And I know I'm getting all weird about it, but that's why I, fi I find it important to protect. And I think that when you deny yourself of your th of, of exposing your soul to the rest of the world, you're denying me of seeing you. 
And that is a big yeah. problem. I want to see, even if I don't like it, I think it's important to see it. So, yeah, you know, I so. agree. and then last one, um, is, is there, um, is there somebody that comes to mind that you think would be a good person to come on the show and to talk to? I can try to reach out to them and, um, but I'm asking all, um, basically all of my guests to nominate. And if I can, I can. And if not, then, you know, it is what it is. But if there's somebody you think is like a, a big thinker or somebody that's in the space that would, you know, be interesting to hear them talk about stuff, not even AI crap. Like it's going to be something completely different. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, man. I mean, I know a lot of good people and there's so many people that <laughs> I don't know that I'd be like, I would just, I would be like, Oh man, I, if you could get them, I'd love to hear that conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll have try. you ever, have you ever spoken with, um, have you ever spoken with Ahmed al No. I don't think he's ever been on your show, right? Mm. Um, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, a lot of my feelings around art uh, were sort of formed when he and I were, uh, you know, we were roommates back in college at Art Center. Mm. Um, and he had a huge influence on me, both on my art and on my thinking. You know, he's a very sensitive guy, very in touch with um the emotional and spiritual aspects of art. He's been on a fascinating journey with um, n internally and also like with his struggles with how he felt people perceived him, what he wanted to do on his own. Mm. Um, he's a crazy good artist. I mean, an absurdly good artist. One, one of the best I've ever met. I, I, I always tell people that like they, they haven't seen half of med's work and the half that he's never shown is some of the best stuff mm. anyone's ever made it's crazy that's beautiful but, um, i like that, I, that that work is hidden sometimes it's good to make work for yourself and never to be seen he's yeah. always been uh so good at that mm. uh I, i've always been impressed by that he's a very prolific guy and he just like has this ability i've never seen really on a lot of people just like he great stuff he just holds it in Hmm. He's just like, that's just for me. That's it's how you know he's wild. doing it though. I appreciate that. I like that. Yeah. Well then since you know him, if you wouldn't mind linking us, I would love to, I mean, that's literally, yeah. it's all based on like voting and pushing it forward. It's, it's, it's like, um, paying it forward basically. And, and I'm hoping that that kind of adds a lot of diversity to it. And, and it also opens up the show to just interesting conversations and focal points on the, the, the human experience, but also the human experience done through the form of an artist, which I think is really interesting um worth talking about and worth worth at this point it's worth really uh holding dear to <laughs> yeah for sure man it's it's the number one priority right now i'd say we we've got we've got all link arms and get through this together yeah absolutely and i would say that'd be one of the things too and if you're listening and you're having like lots of harsh conversations with people about it i'd say take a minute and like think about how you can unify people in in, in a high emotional state and and, and get people to engage and, and to think about this stuff a little bit beyond just the what's happening right now, but how this will affect us all in five to 10 years because and it's all going to come from conversations and, and, and evolving that, that conversation together. So, but yeah, Steven, yeah. you're awesome, dude. I really appreciate your time and hey, no problem. Oh, could I just plug one thing plug, before, plug, before I get off? Whatever you like. Um, if for anyone who, uh, you know, hearing these conversations, uh, if you want to get involved, um, I, I do want to point people at the Concept Art Association's GoFundMe. Oh, uh, you that's can, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, you, you can go, you can find it. I'll, uh, if you wouldn't mind putting a link in the description, that'd yes. be great, of course. But uh, if anyone just wants to find it right now listening, if you just search GoFundMe and protecting artists from AI technologies, you'll find the fund. It's doing very, very well. The Concept Art Association uh, is a great group that has a lot of reach with uh, industry professionals who have been around forever. And they are the real deal and they're really trying to help with this. Um, I would just, if you're interested, please just go check out the fund. Um, they're totally transparent about how they plan on spending the money. So go it. read the description, look at the breakdown. If you agree with it, please consider donating. But uh, I do wanna get some eyes on that because right now, as far as I know, and more stuff is coming out, but right now this is the most actionable thing that's out there for artists to unify um, behind a particular movement that is actually trying to do an action. Like I said, more stuff will come out, but right now this is the one. So I'd like to push people towards that. I love that you're plugging that too. You're not just going like, you know, making cookies on the side, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's, that's the most, that's what I'm most you're concerned about scented right candles? now. No. And, and, and again, yeah. it comes down to, this is why we're having this conversation. You, you, you have a, 
a, a character that's built on driven focus of, of, of a goal and a task, which I, 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 mm. I highly admire. And I, and I, I hope to see it more in people as we move forward because I think that's great. And I did see that and I would suggest it if you are concerned about this stuff, well, f- show it in the form of currency to support what these people are doing because I think it's very important. And I think that this is a part of a bigger conversation that we should keep evolving because I think it's mm-hmm. really pertinent and it's important and it's happening rapidly and it's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's just getting yeah. crazier. <laughs> yeah. Every day gonna, it's like it's hitting the reset button. You're like, no way this is happening. So yeah. every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure yeah. if we have another conversation about this stuff in six months, it'll be a totally different conversation. Which we should. <laughs> I would well. I would think it would be really good to have you back and we can kind of yeah. kind of reassess and go, oh this happened here and that was interesting and that happened there and oh that was really good and that was really bad. And yeah, because yep. it's it's too much noise for me. I have so much going on. It's hard for me to keep up. And Mache literally is, is telling me all this stuff all the time. I'm like, dude, I can't believe this. Yeah, yeah. This is I've, wild. I've, I've got a lot of info sources coming into me now, oh, you know, just because of the connections that I've made. And even me, I'm like, I, I'm missing stuff, you know, yeah. day to day. It's like, it's happening so fast. It's happening crazy fast. It's yeah. rapid. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you, bud. And thank you so much. And yeah, definitely check that out, everybody. And check out your YouTube channel. And, um, you get, they can get at you like everybody can contact or connect with you through like the social media channels like Instagram yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yep. I'm on Instagram. I'm on YouTube. Um, you know, my, I, I, if you follow any of my stuff, any of my things has links to all of the rest of my stuff on there. So you'll be able to poke around and find me. Yeah. Good ecosystem. Hell yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much Ash. Uh, thank you. Yeah. This has been great. <laughs> it's an honor and it's been great to meet you, man. Yeah, you as well. I appreciate your time and your amazing energy and what you're doing for us all. So keep, keep creating that awesome work and getting us thinking about this stuff is very important. So appreciate you. Thank you.